morning the Tuesday March the 2nd 2021 regular Board of County Commission is meeting will now call to order we'll begin with a moment of silent reflection for the first responders and members of the armed forces followed by an invocation by Pastor Larry Bone from the Central Assembly of God and then Vice Chairman O'Brien will lead us in the pledge please rise Father, this morning as we gather together in this chamber, we ask that you give wisdom way beyond our years, that you, Father, would give uh, incredible guidance and as these men and women navigate the affairs of our county, give them your strength and wisdom. Lord, we're grateful that the COVID cases are diminishing in our county. And Lord, we, as many others, we have band together and prayed and, and continue to pray for this disease, this, in, this intrusion into our land uh, be completely annihilated and destroyed. We thank you for the men and women who served us well in our, our medical field. Thank you for their wisdom and their guidance and their help. Lord, we thank you that you have declared that a country, a, a, a city, a county that dwells in righteousness, Lord, Lord, it's because it's ruled by righteous judgment. And I pray that for these men and women today as they rule and guide us and govern us. Thank you. Bless them, bless their homes, their families, and give them an increase in your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is uh, additions, deletions to the agenda. Uh, commissioners, I'd like to add a few moments for Sheriff Eric Flowers uh, to uh, just give us a few words about the upcoming Sheriff's Office, Sheriff's Youth Ranch barbecue, which is tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is there anything else? That Move to approve agenda as amended. Second. That's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams, all in favor? All right. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you so much Thank for making time for, uh, for me this morning to uh, speak about our Youth Ranches Barbecue. Uh, this is the 27th annual Florida Sheriff's Youth Ranches Barbecue hosted at the Indian River County Sheriff's Office tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, from 2 to 7 p.m. Opening festivities, uh, open ceremonies start at 3 p.m. You can get there as early as 2. And the event goes until 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, we are not doing all the traditional inside tours as a result of COVID, but everything outside will be occurring. Uh, masks are encouraged. All of our employees will be wearing masks and uh, we will be safe while we do this. We also have a drive through option for folks who want to participate and be, uh, be there, but aren't able to uh, actually walk around or they're not able to, not, don't feel comfortable being around other people. You pull up on 41st Avenue and we will load uh, barbecue meals into your car at $5 a piece. The price has not changed. It is still $5 and uh, we will be serving pork and chicken. And we've got that great corn that everybody loves. So hopefully you'll come out and join us. It's a good time for the family, good time for for the kids, canine demonstrations, SWAT demonstrations, uh, Mountain Patrol will be there, as well as uh, many of the other uh, fun things that we have on an annual basis. So we hope to see everybody there, and uh, we're excited for the 27th annual barbecue. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank Sheriff, you. Thank, thank you for carrying on this tradition during these difficult times. Uh, our citizens do need something to get out there. This is a perfect event for that, uh, so they can see their sheriff's office and uh, I, I'll tell you what, you can't beat a $5 meal there. 
Nope, it's a great deal. Uh, annually, we raise over $50,000 for the Youth Ranches, which is an amazing program started by the sheriffs more than 50 years ago. Uh, it's kids that we're able to send to these programs that need somewhere to go. And so we're proud to partner with the Youth Ranches. It is a great organization. Uh, and I will mention while I'm here, uh, commissioners, you guys did, uh, I appreciate your vote recently on uh, securing our compound. I will be back to see you before the end of the month uh, with details on that project and where we're at. I know you guys asked for a special spreadsheet it's more detailed information we're going to come back with that info uh, but that's going to impact the barbecue for next year so i know tomorrow is our barbecue and that's what we're here to talk about uh, but the reality is i'm already thinking about next year's barbecue and so uh, we're going to be asking to use the fairgrounds because our compound is going to be secure and so uh, you'll, you'll be having that conversation uh, from from our staff to uh, to be able to move that so that we no longer have uh, anybody inside of the secure area of the sheriff's office so uh, thank you again for for all of your help and support and i look forward to seeing you all tomorrow at our youth ranches barbecue thanks guys sure. thank you see you tomorrow thank you okay show has got a busy schedule that's why we put it right on the beginning um, uh, next is uh, approval of the minutes the regular meeting of december 15 2020 the regular meeting of january 5th 2021 and the regular meeting of january 12th 2021 I, I'm, I'd like to move to approve um, all of the minutes mentioned, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our clerk of the court, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Smith. Um, I think he's done a great job uh, with the minutes. Um, he, they're, you know, they're, they're concise, but they also contain um, the content necessary for someone who did not have the opportunity to attend the meeting to understand what happened at that meeting, the train of thought uh, before a vote. So I'm very happy to see that. That's for the community. I can get whatever I want, but if you can't attend a meeting, you, you now have this option to read the minutes as opposed to watching the entire video of the meeting. And that's on the county website, which is ircgov.com. So again, thank you, Mr. Jeffrey Smith, and uh, I move to approve. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Moss, seconded by Commissioner Adams. I'd just like to add that I see no changes in the reflection of the minutes that have occurred historically uh, throughout our time here at the County Commission. Uh, so I uh, appreciate the support of approving the minutes that the, uh, the clerk has provided in a consistent fashion throughout the years. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Informational items. Commissioners? Um, uh, yes, I, if I'd like to mention I have item uh, 7B, and I would like to welcome uh, Leanna Otis to the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Uh, she'll be representing, she, she works at uh, Vero Beach uh, Regional Airport. She's a business analyst, so I think she'll be perfect for this economic development uh, sector of the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Um, the airport, as everyone knows, is very important, not only to the city, but regionally. And I think going forward, we'll, we'll hopefully see greater cooperation between the, the city and the county with regard to the airport. So I think she'll, she'll prove to be a, a huge asset. And I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, Vero Beach City Manager, Monty Falls, and Vero Beach Councilwoman, Honey Manus, who both participated in this selection process. So welcome to uh, Ms. Otis. And I'd also mention um, seven, I'm not sure who prepares this list, but 7C, which is the Indian River County Venue Event Calendar Review. That's a mouthful. Um, that, by the way, did not contain the sheriff's event. So thank you to, the, to our chairman for inviting the sheriff because his event was not uh, contained therein and probably should be. And maybe there may be. It's not at a. It's not at a county venue. It's at the sheriff's office, which is not one of the venues that we schedule. So this calendar is for events happening at venues that the county schedules or rents out. So that's why it's not on there. It was not a slight at the sheriff in any way, shape, or form. Oh no, I didn't mean that it was a slight uh, uh, to the sheriff, but I, I was just surprised not to see it there. I, I would hope that it would just contain any event that's occurring in the county. But if it gets more complicated than that, well, then that's it's, why other then it's then it's more complicated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Anything else? Mr. Okay. Chairman, if I may. Yes. The uh, middle school baseball teams in this yes, county, they're uh, going to be able to play their games at Jackie Robinson Training Center for the next two weeks. And uh, I think that's just absolutely wonderful. That's something those kids will remember for the rest of their lives, being able to play on a facility like that. And I appreciate Rachel and, and Jeff yes. and, and, and all their staff at, at Jackie Robinson on, on making this happen. So just thought I'd let them know. I think they play their first games today at 4.30 this afternoon. I, I think that's just another indication that we're making great strides in recovery uh, during the, uh, the, the COVID times. And we have had uh, a great experience uh, at the fairgrounds. The fairgrounds have been explosive in attendance and uh, there's a lot of events. I want to thank staff to make sure that uh, they, we acknowledge them that uh, they're ensuring that we have events and uh, they're well attended. Uh, it's a great indication that we are putting COVID behind us. Thank you. If I did, I forgot the girls softball is all going to play out there yes. too. Yes. So the middle school girls softball is playing out there too. So. It's just uh, another Another great event. Well, with that, we'll move on uh, to the consent agenda. Commissioners? Hearing none, is there anybody in attendance that would like anything on the consent agenda pool for further discussion, review, examination? Seeing none? Move consent. Second. Agenda. That's a motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Ehrman. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. On uh, pub There are no public items or uh, public discussion items. However, we do have some public notice items which will uh, call upon our counselor. Thank you very much. Um, we have two public notice items. The first is a notice of a scheduled public hearing, which will be to consider modifications to the county code, section 201.22. This is legislative in nature. Additionally, we have a notice of a scheduled public hearing to consider 51st Avenue and portions of Winter Beach Highlands and Winter Beach Park subdivisions water assessment, also legislative in nature. Those will be our two public hearings that are coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor. With that, the next item on the agenda is the uh, County Administrative Matters, and uh, County Administrator Jason Brown will provide us with an update regarding the COVID-19 vaccination. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Just want to provide a brief update of where we are on the uh, vaccine and the vaccination process. Um, so starting out, uh, just kind of uh, kind of show where the, if you go to the next slide, um, show where the state is overall. Um, so a little over 3 million Floridians have been vaccinated, have received at least their first vaccine. Um, that is 13.8% of the state population. Um, that is up, uh, up from about 2.9% from, uh, from the last time uh, we were here two weeks ago. Um, so in that two weeks, uh, 630,000 people in the great state of Florida did receive their vaccine. Um, the largest group of folks, the 65 and older, uh, they're at 2.3 million out of uh, a total population of about 4.9 million 65 and older residents in the state of Florida. So they're 47% uh, nearing that 50% mark of the 65 and older population for the state. Um, so next uh, we've got the same info for, the, for Indian River County. So uh, slightly over 40,000 residents as of, uh, as of uh, Sunday um, had received uh, the, their first vaccine, which is a little over a quarter of the population. So you'll see there that uh, we are we are again significantly ahead of the state overall, which I think is a testament to uh, emergency management, um, our Parks and Rec folks, um, the uh, the and the health department in in uh, in getting those uh, vaccines uh, and keeping those going at the fairgrounds. In addition to the other folks, uh, the other resources out there, um, such as Publix, uh, Treasure Coast Community Health, uh, Whole Family Health, and the, and the hospitals that have been providing those. Um, again, that is that is up from 17 and a half percent two weeks ago. So uh, we did eight percent in the last two two weeks. So that's we're doing four percent a week. 
um, and uh, compared to you know a, a little under two percent per week for the state so we continue to run ahead of the state overall so if we look at the 65 and older population again there um, we have vaccinated over 35,000 of our residents uh, that are 65 and older is about 50,000 of those uh, so we have reached two-thirds a little over two-thirds of our over 65 population um, and if you go to the next slide um, this is a nice little report from the state that shows all of the counties and where they are on vaccinations for their 65 and older <clears throat> you can see us highlighted there down towards the bottom of the list where we've done uh, this is sorted by the most uh, 65 and older residents um, so uh, we are at 67 percent uh, in a dead heat with Alachua I would point out though that Alachua has 14 percent of their population or one out of seven people in Alachua County is is over 65 and we are 33 percent or one out of three so any of those places that have a higher percentage of their 65 and older crowd vaccinated have a much lower percentage of their population that is 65 and older so I've highlighted a few of the others that have 30 percent or more of of the population the closest one to us is Martin County um, which has 31 percent of their population is is uh, 65 and older and they've vaccinated 59 percent of those you can go Collier 57 percent Flagler 54 percent you go on up the list and it goes down from there so um, of the communities that have 30 uh, percent or more of their population that's over 65 um, we are th we are the highest um, and have the most vaccinated um, so I think uh, we are performing at the front of the pack um, and uh, and I think that's a testament to the uh, to the good job that that is being done out there uh, by our folks and a lot of hard work has gone into that um, another thing our progress through our wait list um, we have a little over 15,000 total people on the wait list most of the people are not on the wait no, most of that 15,000 is not on the wait list we have provided um, vaccines for over 6,000 of them um, another 3,500 people have indicated that they're no longer interested in receiving an appointment um, I call that the category I got my shot at Publix already so between those two categories we are close to 10,000 out of that 15,000 have either received a shot from us or uh, are not interested anymore likely because they already received the shot somewhere else so that leaves us with about 5400 people out of that 15,000 um, that have not had an appointment scheduled as of yet so we are um, about two-thirds of the way through our list um, I would also point out I don't know the I don't have the exact uh, detail on this but m many of those 5400 have already rec received an invitation for uh, an appointment but have said you know that that, that time is 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 not good for them um, and that's something that I just want to talk about a little bit I think as we're at 67 percent um, we are I, I think we've worked through a lot of the 65 and older population um, and so I, I think most of the folks that are most anxious to get vaccinated have 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 had the opportunity to do so um, either at our at the fairgrounds or through some other source and this is just a shows a little report for for an invitation that we sent out uh, yesterday for a Thursday vaccine we sent it out to 110 people um, 14 took the appointment so we've got about a 13 percent acceptance rate on this one and this is fairly typical of where we are so we've got a lot of people saying um, so you see that 15 no longer are interested in the shot probably got the shot somewhere else 21 that time wasn't good send me another time um, 55 not confirmed that means they haven't responded to us we've seen that percentage go way up early on almost everybody was responding to us so I think what was one of the things we're seeing is these are people they've already received a, an, a, 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 an appointment notification from us um, and they're they're not just they're just not responding so um, I, I say all that to say I think we are we are digging down to where most of the people on the list have received the opportunity for an appointment and we will we will continue working through those um, so I, I think that just shows the progress because if you know let's say we're gonna end up at 80 percent I don't think we're gonna have hundred percent of our 65 and older that get the vaccine there's gonna be some portion 
of the population that doesn't want the vaccine. Um, we hope that's a relatively low portion. Um, but, you know, if we're at 67 percent and we're on the way to 80, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to end up vaccinating every single 65 and older person. So um, I say all that to say we're, we're making our way through um, that list pretty well. So with that, um, uh, an, an, uh, a good segue is yesterday that the, uh, the governor um, put out a new executive order um, and and that order goes into effect tomorrow and it adds new groups that are eligible for the vaccine. Um, those groups are K through 12 school employees that are 50 or older um, and sworn law enforcement officers that are 50 and older, as well as firefighters that are 50 and older. Um, there is also some more flexibility in the previous executive order. Only hospitals could provide a vaccine to someone under 65 um, because they met some medical necessity. Um, the executive order that goes into effect tomorrow in, in, increases the the universe of of who can do that. So it used to be just or, or as we sit here today, it's only hospitals, but licensed physicians um, can vaccinate people um, that have been deemed extremely vulnerable to COVID. There's a whole process that they go through. Others can provide uh, nurse practitioners and pharmacists can can provide that with the note from the doctor, as I understand it. Um, so. Uh, there will be more venues for for folks to be able to get uh, get the vaccine if they're in in that category of under 65 but vulnerable to COVID. So some new groups there, um, working our way through that. I will say that our our folks have reached out to law enforcement and the schools to schedule to to, to schedule those employees, the K through 12 teachers and the law enforcement officers um, over 50. And those will be done through uh, what's called a closed pod process. So we've, we've reached out to the law enforcement agencies, City of Vero PD, City of Sebastian PD, Sheriff's Office, um, and, and uh, those for law enforcement, I, I believe the first clinic is scheduled for Thursday, and they're working to schedule the first clinic for the uh, school employees this weekend um, so that we can get those, those new groups um, vaccinated as well. Um, so with that, um, uh, Johnson and Johnson um, was has been has received emergency use authorization by by the federal government over the weekend. The state of Florida, as I understand, is getting 175,000 doses of um, of Johnson and Johnson this week, in addition to the 400,000 that they'll get in Moderna and Pfizer. So having a new vaccine um, will increase the, the the overall supply. So we hope that's that that will be uh, will be something that will that will move the process along even more quickly. Another thing, just big picture, I want to say we're, we're over a quarter of the population has, been, has received their first vaccine at least. So we've been doing that. Bas that's basically January and February. So that's two months. Um, I think the pace, if anything, is going to pick up from here with a third vaccine. Um, early on, Moderna and Pfizer weren't getting as much out um, as you wouldn't at the beginning of a run. Um, so I think if anything, that next 25 percent will, will would come faster um so you know if we're doing if we're doing uh 25 percent every every two months you know in four more months we'd be at 75 percent which is you know the the i i think the goal of where where they want to get i think i think by the before we get there we'll probably be in the in the business of it'll be a complete change from where we were a month or two ago where we've got tremendous demand and limited supply um, I, I think in, in the next couple of months, we'll be dealing with, with more supply and trying to en encourage, you know, people to, to come get those shots, you know, before we get, uh, before we get all the way into summer. So, um, uh, but, but I think overall we're, we're making, making good progress through that, seeing the light at the end of the, uh, vaccine tunnel, and hopefully that's going to give us light at the end of the COVID tunnel overall. So, uh, so with that, I'll stop talking. And if you guys have any questions, um, I'll give them a shot. Mr. Sherman. Um, <clears throat> a couple things, Jason. One, um, just want to point out that the calls and emails we've been getting have consistently been positive about the operations at the fairgrounds. Um, everybody has just been um, j just full of praise for the job we're, they're doing out there. So again, kudos to the health department folks, our emergency services folks, our community partners, and everybody else who's been out there. Um, people are just ranting and raving about what a good process that is. So I want to get that out. Secondly, the calls are coming in 
now that we have the wait list up and operating, those calls are, are coming in as, as more appreciative, um, kind of like we thought that once people know their name is on a list, they can calm down. And, and But those calls have been turning positive now as well. So good things there. Um, with, I guess, Jason, right now, we, we still can't open up our waiting list to any other age groups until the governor says, okay, people just over age of 60 can now get it. Is that correct? We have to kind of wait to, to open that up to more age groups? Yeah, we don't know exactly what is going to come next, what the, what the governor is going to allow next. So we basically, once, once we get that information, we can start, we can, we can, the good thing about the system we have is we can pretty quickly update that. Right now the system says, if, are you 65 or older? We can change that. We can add a question that says, are you 60 or older? If that's the next, if that's right. the next leap, or if you're a, you know, are you a, a law enforcement officer or something like that? So we can, the good thing about the system is pretty quickly, we can, we can get that adjusted and then we can add those new groups in and, and, and get them through the system. As soon as, as soon as the governor flips the switch, we can start, start putting those people on the, on the, on the wait list and getting shots to those folks. Okay. And then on the, we had talked about this yesterday, but on the J&J &J vaccine, um, apparently it's only about 66% effective to where you'd get a mild to moderate case, but it is about 85% effective to prevent you from being severe enough to go to the hospital. And we probably still don't know yet, you know, if we're ever going to get any J&J &J, and then what if people don't want that one? They would rather do the two shot thing and get 95%. So I, I know we can't answer that question yet, but maybe we just need to be thinking about how we're going to handle that. I, I would think myself personally, now that, and I'm 63, so I'm, I'm probably in the next tranche. Um, I think I'd rather wait and make sure I get the two dose and be 95% than take the one shot and have lower, um, effectiveness and that might just be me uh, maybe younger people say yeah that's good because i'm healthy and they'll be happy with that so i think we just kind of need to think about how we're going to handle that when it rolls out um, and what people's preference might be as far as which vaccine they want to get so just keep that in mind i guess yeah it's good 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 point you know that there's you know now uh there may be people that want one one shot more than the other um, I can just tell you right now we are giving the Pfizer vaccine at the fairgrounds. That's the most difficult one to handle. It's got to be kept cold, coldest the longest. Moderna has to be kept about equally as cold, but it has more uh, shelf time once it's come out of the deep freeze. Um, so one of the things is we're seeing like at the Publix is locally they've got Moderna um, because Pfizer is harder to control. I, I don't know what vaccines we're going to get going forward. We, we started out with Moderna for about the first three weeks and we've been doing Pfizer since then. My guess, you know, one of the things about Johnson & Johnson is it's just one shot um, and it doesn't have to be kept as cold. It can be kept at the regular refrigerator freezer temperatures, right? So um, I think, you know, just guessing, and this is just Jason guessing, I don't really have any, any, any special knowledge on this but that that's going to be able to be handled at say more doctor's offices that wouldn't be that wouldn't have the equipment to handle the the pfizer so mm -hmm. it would seem like i'm just guessing that they may get more i think um it, when it comes to level of difficulty pfizer is the highest so they're able to accomplish that out there at the fairground so i think they'll you know there's a good chance we'll continue doing doing pfizer out there um, again, we, we may get J and J as well, or, or Moderna, who knows? Um, but I just, just big picture thought. I think one of the things about the, the Johnson and Johnson one is it, is it can kind of expand places that can offer the shot and we can already do Pfizer. And if I was, I would think the state would, would expand the, the Johnson and Johnson to places that, that, that aren't equipped to do the, don't have the deep freezers because those, I mean, it's like 74 below zero, these things have to be kept at. So it's not just any regular equipment. So, um, that's, that's just my guess, but we'll, we'll continue to, to, to work through that issue going forward. And it, and it's a, a great point and a, and a great question, but, uh, I think, uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that we'll be, we'll be doing those, those more difficult ones as, as we go. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you. You have anything, Joe? Jason, most of the, uh, the the firefighters were done already, right? Because of the direct contact with patients and stuff like that, they've already they've already been offered all the age groups for that. So those those doses should be able not that there's that many, but that those doses should be able to put back in the system, right? Right. So so the 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 determination that was made here was our fire uh, were were consolidated, dual certified. Our firefighters are paramedics or at least EMTs and they provide medical care. So they fit the definition of healthcare professional with direct patient contact. Obviously somebody's got COVID, they call the they call nine one one. Our our folks are interacting with them. They have been eligible. Um, I, perhaps that firefighter one is just to, for clarification in case there was a doubt about that. Maybe there's a place where you've got separate paramedics and firefighters and maybe you've got firefighters that are ju just do fires and don't do medical care or something and maybe it's maybe it's taking care of those but locally our firefighters um, have had the opportunity to, to receive the shot already under the previous under the previous order good yeah and also I, I think uh, Commissioner Ryan had a good question with that about the you know the J and J vaccine coming out too that maybe I don't know if, if, if it's possible people may want an option or just to uh, there may be some way to to do that for y'all but uh, I think that's a good good suggestion uh, hopefully like you said it'll expand our horizon to uh, offer more vaccines and then uh, but everything I've read on and heard on the Johnson vaccine they're saying that the testing was done at a little different time it's good against the variants and it, and it actually has the potential to be stronger and, and, and again for people that it's easier just to do one shot, that's the, that that might be their option for the for the way to go, and they said especially for the younger uh, people that are less susceptible with comorbidities with uh, the, against COVID, the Johnson the Johnson shot might be might be to fit their lifestyle a little better. Yeah, and that's and that's one you know you just have to go once. Um, I think the difference between you know you hear the 67 percent versus the 95, and it seems like a big difference, but. When you're when you're really getting down to it, why have we been concerned about COVID? Is not because hey, I might be sick for three days. It's because you may have that ICU visit, or 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 someone may 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 die from that. So the Johnson and Johnson vaccine performed very well on that, like the 85 percent, and nearly 100 percent on on fatalities, I believe. Um, and 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 it was tested there. I think a significant part of that test was exposed to like the South African variant which there's a question about how well the others do against that. So it was maybe in a harder environment that it was being tested. So there may not be as much difference between the efficacy of Johnson and Johnson as, as, as it seems like from the, from, the, from the headline number. And I think at the end of the day, if, if you can get any of the three vaccines, I think, I think it's good to do um, and, uh, and go, ahead and go ahead and get that because, it's, because any of the three is gonna provide good protection against COVID. And, and against the worst effects of COVID, for sure. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner? I have nothing, thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank uh, you. May I say one thing? Sure. I, I just want to thank uh, uh, Chief Stone and also uh, Treasure Coast Community Healthcare. Uh, they, were, they were out there on the fairgrounds. Uh, and you may recall they actually started, I think it was right after New, New Year's Eve uh, that weekend. And the many, many volunteers in the community, uh, especially uh, special thanks to Rotary for coming forward uh, to help administer this vaccine. Um, I think the staff has done a wonderful job. Um, and, th and, th and thank you for that. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great turning point. Next item on the agenda is the county attorney matters, which is the Economic Development Council appointment. Councilor. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a vacancy on the Economic Development Council for the local tourist representative position. Uh, we have received an application from an eligible applicant, uh, David uh, Lee David Hunter. Uh, simply the county attorney's office recommends the board consider the application that was presented and uh, determine whether to fill the vacancy on the Economic Development Council. And with that, I turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Um, yep. I, um, I, I, well, I'm being on uh, Vero Beach City Council. I had the opportunity to, um, to know Mr. Hunter as a successful businessman uh, running the Vero Beach Hotel 
and also to know of his dedication uh, to the community. So I would be happy to, uh, to nominate him for this position, to make a motion to nominate him, pending any further discussion that anyone else might like to add. Thank you. We have a second. A motion by Commissioner Moss, seconded by Vice Chairman O'Brien. Any further discussion? Excellent choice. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Well, we're moving right along, and we don't have, uh, we have one more item here for the appointments, the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee appointment. Councillor. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to introduce uh, Cassidy this morning, Cassidy Brown. She is uh, an intern with our office this semester. She is a uh, the Vermont with Vermont Law School and she's decided to use her last semester there to kind of learn a little bit more about the law from the perspective of kind of working in a law office so we're very excited to have her and wanted to give her the opportunity to uh, present the next item so with that I'm going to turn it back over to Chad Cassidy Welcome. good morning commissioners can you hear me this matter is concerning the appointment for the affordable housing advisory committee there is a vacancy of the position of citizen who actively serves on the county's local planning agency. This position has been vacant since December. It was brought to the board January 12th by the county attorney to state that there were no um, qualified applicants. And per the board's instructions, they asked the county attorney's office to ask the planning and zoning commission if they had any nominees to fill the position. On February 11th, um, deputy attorney Bill DeBraw asked the Planning and Zoning Commission if they had any nominees, and they nominated Curtis Carpenter Jr. to fill the vacancy. The staff is recommending that the board consider the nominee and decide whether to fill the position with Curtis Carpenter Jr. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to uh, move approval of Curtis Carpenter as appointee to the Affordable Housing Committee. Second. And thank you, Cassidy, for the memo. Do we have any discussion? Anybody in the audience? I don't see Mr. Carpenter here. So, although he was well represented. Uh, just one question for Cassie. Cassie, was this one of those things where everybody on the PNZ took a step backwards and Curtis was just standing there? <laughs> Um, I think they they all kind of just as a consensus decided that he would be the best. Okay. <laughs> She's already doing so well, isn't she? Oh yeah. That's a great answer. <laughs> it's a learning experience. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Thank you very much. Jesse, uh, you got your first five all here. <laughs> That's better okay. than Dylan does a lot of times. <laughs> and we thank you. I'm going to strive to live up to Cassidy's success rate. <laughs> oh. All right, the next item uh, under commission matters uh, was uh, Commissioner Laura Moss wanted to uh, present uh, a small nonprofit grant program. Commissioner Moss. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, first I'd like to thank the uh, the taxpayers. You think about it, the money money comes. It uh, doesn't. It's not pennies from heaven. And we did receive the county. Uh, I mean, did receive uh, federal and state funding. So thank thank you to everyone. Um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Tom Kindred. I called him the other day, and uh, he answered the phone, which was great. You know, that hardly ever happens. And he agreed immediately to process uh, the nonprofit applications uh, should the commission uh, decide to go forward with it. And Mr. Kindred runs the uh, Small Business Development Center. And for those who might not know, he processed the, uh, the small business uh, grant applications. So he's very much uh, familiar with this and he did a wonderful job doing that and, uh, and, and readily agreed to do the same for the nonprofits. Um, I'd like to, you know, to also thank, you know, United Way and Treasure Coast Food Bank. Um, you know, they're, they're large players and they've been of great assistance um, during COVID. Um, specifically, what I hope to address with the small 
nonprofit grants. And remember, this is a grant, not a loan, for the small businesses that would, the, the amount did not need to be repaid. You might recall, and I'm addressing the community, you might recall that we started in January with a $5,000 amount, and we didn't have a lot of takers. It was almost like a reverse bank robbery that we were standing there with bags of money and no one was coming to, uh, to apply for it. But we did get the word out, and we did increase that amount to $10,000 uh, over time. So that, uh, that program, I think, was, was a huge help to, uh, to our businesses. And the small businesses and small nonprofits are similar in a number of ways. But one of the ways that, that is truly striking to me is that they are unique and, uh, you know, to our community. And that's what we need to do, in my opinion, to support what makes us unique, um, that which makes us who and what we are. And our small nonprofits and small businesses do that. And remember, they're both businesses. There are for-profit businesses and not-for-profit businesses. The point being, if, 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 we, if COVID kills the small nonprofits, it, it kills our sense of place, this place, our community, our county, and it just it kills our sense of community in, in doing that. So, and by that I mean how, how we meet each other, how we get together, how we learn together, how we have new experiences together, whether, uh, whether it's uh, our art, our music, our nature experiences, experiencing our history, just you know, cutting loose together at a downtown Friday, or reaching out to, to comfort each other like Love of Paws does. Um, that, you know, that creates a sense of belonging by creating something worth belonging to. And, mm -hmm. and I think what we've seen with the, and we know that people are coming here. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen it in the media and pro probably ex had our own personal experiences with that. Um, the wonderful thing about sense of belonging is we already have it. We have it. The people that are coming here are longing to belong. And we already have that. So all we need to do is preserve it. And I think helping our small nonprofits is a very important part of that. So what I did today was um, I invited, because uh, of course they have additional insight to offer, I invited some of our small nonprofits. They certainly can speak for themselves, and I'm, I'm delighted that a number of them are here. So I'd like to invite them um, individually to come forward and, and offer the commission some insight as to you know your specific organizations take a few minutes and uh, to, um, to to help us in uh, you know in, in understanding your needs and and your situation and if I may I would call first uh, Dr. Crystal Bajol of the Gifford Youth Orchestra. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Jason, you can take me off your list. I got one shot. I'm 80 and took care of that. Okay. Some of you do know about my organization. A couple of you I've not met before, but good morning to you. And I represent the Gifford Youth Orchestra. I'm the founder and the artistic director. We're 18 years old. We started back in 2003. <clears throat> That's not a COVID cough. Got the shot. You said what, Joe? You have the shot. Oh, yeah. I ha I'm half safe. <laughs> Our program offers primarily music education to children primarily at risk in the Gifford community, Gifford and neighboring communities. Not only do we offer music education, but we deal with the, ch the whole child. We just use music as a hook to help develop character, confidence, poise. We teach them how to budget their money, how to shop. Um, we give them classes in etiquette and nutrition. We have a website if you'd like to know more about us. It. very simple, gyotigers.org. And Joe can give you, I'm sorry, Commissioner Flesher can give you the contact. Yeah, can give you the contact for that. 
Uh, but I do want to speak to you about why we are asking or supporting Commissioner Moss in this effort to recognize our small non-business, our small nonprofit business as part of uh, the program that you are offering support to. When we applied for our PPP loan this year, we were denied because the way we are organized is that all of our staff are, are subcontractors and we were disqualified because we don't have quote unquote normal or regular payroll. Well, that's the way we have to operate because most of our employees are teachers and they're part time. And so uh, the subcontractor works for our program and that's how we are able to maintain and also offer the program at a very reduced price to the families. We only charge families $10 a month for their classes, uh, $10 for violin and $40 a month for piano. Additionally, our staff is composed of, comprised of uh, volunteers. But with the COVID, the volunteers that have children are not as available to assist us because they're home doing the homeschooling. So our staff has been reduced in that manner. And then our parents who do contribute, even though it's a small amount, but they contribute to their children's education. But many of them are not working. And so that's another loss of revenue for us. All those losses um, build up and and add to our issues because with COVID, we can't teach classes live. We don't have classes. Everything is one-to-one -one on Zoom. So we've had to increase the number of teachers while we are losing money on the other side. We would appreciate having that special assistance because there's no place else for us to turn at this time. Yes, we write for grants, uh, but the grants that come in locally, well, all of us in the nonprofit arena are in competition for those same grants. Your uh, donation, your contribution to our program and to the program of all the nonprofits would be of great assistance. We nonprofits have organized <clears throat> to improve our ability to serve. We meet twice a month uh, under the leadership of Barbara Schlitt, who's going to speak in a minute. And we are working to improve our services, uh, build capacity, and to collaborate so that we can offer better services. So I'm hoping that you will consider and approve this proposition that uh, Commissioner Moss is setting before you. It will not only help us now, but keep in mind that what we do for our children today affects our and their future. Thank you, um, Commissioner Moss, for allowing me to speak. Doc, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I've always, through the years, appreciated the great work that you have done in taking the hands, the hearts, and the minds of these young individuals and presenting a very enjoyable experience. And while they're getting education, we were afforded the opportunity to hear some great music. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that you had uh, a lot of events and through the COVID time could not have those events, but you did have a virtual event, did you not? How did that work out, Doc? Oh, actually, we've had two virtual events. Thank you for asking. We had our annual concert last year in November. And because we have so many students um, for, to perform, we couldn't do it all in one day. So we took 22 days last year to have a concert. It wore us out. Uh, <laughs> and we learned a lesson from that. So when we had our Black History program just this past weekend, we did it in two days. And if you didn't get a link to that, I'll be sure. Oh, I know I sent one to you, Commissioner. And if you would share that, that would be wonderful. But. Um, there was, the Black History Program was not a fundraiser, but the annual concert last year was, and we did very well with uh, support from the public for that. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions? Thank you, thank, you, thank you, Dr. Michelle. Um, next, I'd like to invite Mr. Ted Pankiewicz, uh, Love of Pause. Good morning, Ted Pankowitz, Director of the Love of Pause, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Moss, for the invitation. And also want to thank all of the rest of the commissioners uh, at the, on the board that uh, made us successful over this. In fact, uh, today is our sixth anniversary of getting our 501 nonprofit status wow. for IRS, so it's an anniversary of sorts for ours. We've, uh, our, our mission statement is to provide peace of mind to senior citizens who can no longer care for their pets when placed into hospice, memory care, assisted living, nursing homes, and so forth. And through an officer, through senior resources here in the county, we started a Pause Meals on Wheels program five years ago, which has now grown into a tremendous uh, uh, effort here in the county where we supply over 10,000 pounds of free pet food to senior citizens, disabled veterans, homebound people, anybody, anybody on SSI, Social Security. And we've grown by leaps and bounds through what we would say teamwork with other organizations here in the county. And just for example, back in January, when you guys graciously awarded us a proclamation uh, awarded for, for our love of pause operation, and it's led to other opportunities for funding and also for support through other groups and organizations. In fact, the Bureau Beach Magazine will be coming out with a large article about us just because of the proclamation back in January. So I wanna thank everybody you know, for that. And, you know, we had our annual board meeting last night and I presented a check that I just received the day before for $5 that was written by a senior citizen. And I have this $5 check now in a frame on my, behind my desk. And I said to our board members, you know, I can vis visualize this elderly person writing this $5 check in support of our organization. And I said, we are stewards of the money that we receive and through sponsorship and through donations and in-kind support through organizations and in in individuals and sponsors. And we have to look at how can, we, how, how can I use that $5 check, as I said to our board members, how can I use that $5 check to reach as many people here in our community that, that are in need? And there are so many, and the need is growing. Uh, last year, we, were, we, we gave out 127,000 pounds of free pet food last year. We spent thousands of dollars on uh, vet bills supporting senior citizens and their pets. We used transportation to taking seniors and their pets to, 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 vet, to veterinary appointments and also for groomers and there's such a need out there and I, I said to our board members of this five dollar check every time we spend money we have to look at that five dollar check and say how can we meet, reach the most people with the limited amount of resources that is available to us and that's the that's the, what is presented to use too with the amount of resources that is available here in the county how can you spread it and reach the most amount of people that are in need as we do with our organization so I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you for your past support, and uh, we're, we're making a difference here in the county with our organization. Thank you. Ted, if, if, if I may, um, how's fundraising going during the COVID time? <clears throat> we've been lucky enough to, because, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to maintain our, our, our numbers for the past year. Uh, United Way was, uh, gave us a $2,500 uh, donation for pet food. Uh, we'll give you an example as far as need from January 1st, January and February, we spent $3,700 of our own money in purchasing pet food to make up the difference from what, actually because of the growing need that's out there. And uh, fundraising, we, we've been lucky to have the support from the community and the organizations here in the county. But the, the need is growing. For example, uh, Meals on Wheels was one of our first uh, organizations. We used to bring 40 bags of dog food and cat food to Meals on Wheels every, every Monday morning. And just in the past two weeks, that's increased to 95 bags of dog food and cat food every Monday morning, mm -hmm. every Monday morning to the senior really? resources organization. Wow. 40 bags, of, 95 bags of dog food and cat food, which comes out to about eight, eight, 900 pounds a, a week that we're giving meals on wheels. Wow. Thank you, Ted. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do for the community. Um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Ms. Janie Graves Hoover, from, uh, Main Street, Vero Beach, Executive Director. Thank you for inviting uh, Main Street Vero Beach, Laura. I'm Janie Graves Hoover. I'm a volunteer with Main Street Vero Beach and I'm currently serving as the board president. Main Street's mission is to preserve, protect the um, historical downtown business district and residential area. Um, 
Our nonprofit serves our stakeholders in the geography, but we also serve the community at large. Um, we are a business, just like every other business. We have employees and overhead, and at the end of the year, um, we are not um, keeping money for stockholders. We have done programs and presented things that benefit the community. Main Street Vero Beach is known for our events, which um, our mission was to bring as many people together as possible in downtown, and um, that mission is on pause because of COVID and um, caused us to miss two years of our biggest fundraiser for our nonprofit. Our events serve um, three purposes. First of all, they bring people to the geography to have placemaking experiences. <laughs> Um, with our Hibiscus Festival, we have artists from all over the country who come in and we, um, it's a destination event, it's two days. And um, it, all of our events also provide a platform for businesses, including nonprofits. People who sign up to participate in our Downtown Friday for three hours can be assured that hundreds of people are going to be walking past their business. It's an opportunity for them to engage and a social setting and follow up with those people later to sell them their services. If you're a nonprofit, they have met donors at our events. They've also recruited volunteers. So we provide a platform for businesses as well. The events also provide a significant amount of income to Main Street Vero Beach. We'll have missed our Hibiscus Festival for two years and we've missed 10 Downtown Fridays. Now, with the good news about the vaccine and the COVID numbers going down, we do hope to bring our events back soon, but it's taken a significant toll on our income. The other thing that has um, been significant in downtown is the vacancy rate. In the beginning of 2020, we were so optimistic about a year of growth and we had very few vacancies. Because of COVID and because of the economic situation, some of the businesses in downtown are vacant now. So um, we see businesses coming back in, but our focus has been economic redevelopment for our small businesses. If we are able to apply for this grant from the county, you can count on us being good stewards of the money. We had, um, in the beginning of 2020, we had one full-time employee and a half-time employee. We are down to one employee working at a significant um, reduction in salary. Um, we have filled in with dedicated volunteers, but it's certainly been a challenge. I wanna invite everybody here to come to downtown. Tomorrow, um, this week is the first Friday of the month and we are having our gallery stroll, which is a socially distance and open air event. You can go into the galleries wearing a mask. Um, come downtown, learn more. And if we're able to apply for a grant from the county, we will use it to benefit the community. Does anybody have questions? Uh, Janie, did you all apply for a PPP grant? We were able to get the first PPP payroll protection grant, mm -hmm. and that was a significant help. Um, when we analyze our financial position and we will be applying for a second one. Okay, thank you. J Jane, were you able to uh, apply through the United Way? We did not qualify for the United Way funds. <clears throat> you didn't because of the amount of employees you have? We only have one employee and um, she's working at a significant reduction right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time this morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Ruth Stambridge of the Inuever County Historical Society. Jason can take me off that list too, because I just had both my shots. There you go. I'm ready to go. Good morning, my name is Ruth Stanbridge and I'm here today to represent another small nonprofit, the Indian River County Historical Society. And thank you first for giving us the opportunity to advocate for the 
continuation of these small grants. They're so important to all of us. We were hit hard too by the pandemic and we're still reeling from it. We have two museums, a house museum and an exhibit museum, which we have not been able to open. They're small areas and it's just not worth it, the danger to the public coming in. And the first cycle of CARES, the Indian River County Historical Society did not qualify because our mission did not meet the guidelines set for the nonprofits or for a small business. Even though we recognize that and identify as a small business, our profits are returned immediately to the community, not to our business. So we didn't qualify. In a crisis like these, small nonprofits have nowhere to turn. It is obvious that after these dreadful months, the value of nonprofits locally is more defined. We offer a substantial boost to the mental health, the well being, and the happiness of our community. And we don't even miss that until it's not there. We feel the small organizations like ours provide that sense of place. We talk about that a lot, but that's a unique enjoyment and satisfaction that you can't achieve otherwise. Our historical society, made up of all volunteers, link the various parts of the county, giving it a, a stability, a connectivity, co togetherness, and safety. We know every part of our county, and we know people in every part of our county, and it makes us all feel much better. It makes a healthier environment, and sometimes, again, we do not know we need that till it's gone or almost gone. Organi organizations like ours depend on the revenue that come from memberships, community events, and donations. But during this pandemic, we've had to forego many of these community events and programs. We couldn't have our Pineapple Festival, we couldn't have our Santa Lucia Christmas, and we couldn't have our uh, programs and exhibits that we have each month. Not only did we lose revenue, but an important part of our community was, was put on hold. But the light bill still had to be paid. We had to purchase new AC equipment because we do have artifacts that have to be climate controlled and there always seemed to be a bill from the plumber. But all these expensive during this past year, so with the new year and months of pandemic still ahead of us, we're, our budget is looking a little bleak. It's like waking up from a bad dream and as we look around we are seeing familiar, or we want to see familiar and stable things. We want that sense of place. So we urge this commission to continue the grant program, especially for the small nonprofits. It will give us an opportunity to come back more robust and stronger and return to familiar and stabilization. So we need our help. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, uh, Ruth, um, did y'all try to come up with any other different fundraising activities? Because I know um, a lot of, of the groups have gone to virtual events and things like that. Have, has the Historical Society explored any alternative um, fundraising options? I'm sorry, Peter, I'm sorry. Okay. So a lot of um, other nonprofits have turned to like virtual fundraising events. So has the Historical Society looked at any alternative fundraising events? We haven't had that opportunity because what we show has to be out in, outside in person mostly. Uh, we do have our videos that are online, but we have not capitalized on that because of the complications of our Zooms. And, and again, we were not able to get any of the funding for the technology that we needed for some of those things as we didn't Thank qualify.
The only thing, the only fundraiser that we attempted was our playing cards. That was a, a Christmas event, and we took our video, I mean, our, took our old photos, we put them on playing cards, and they went over very well. Uh, but other than that, we have not been able to have in-person uh, exhibits or displays or anything like that. Uh, we have just lived on our donations and our memberships, and they've been down. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Barbara Schlitt Ford, uh, Director of the Environmental Learning Center. Hi, good morning, Commissioners and County Attorney Ryan Gold, County Administrator Brown. Thanks so much for letting us speak with you today and share a bit about what's going on in the nonprofit world in our community. I'm Barbara Schlitt Ford, Executive Director of the Environmental Learning Center, and I also serve as facilitator for a informal coalition of nonprofit leaders serving Indian River County, and we call ourselves Indian River CARES, but our CARES stands for Connect, Advocate, Renew, Educate, and Strategize. Our nonprofits represent approximately 10% of our local businesses. We are small businesses that might be described as profit, but solely to provide a public benefit through the services that we provide in our community. However, as others have mentioned, just like any other business, we do need to have a balanced budget with annual expenses being less than or equal to our annual revenue. Speaking just for the ELC now, we lost all of our revenue for the school district field trips this year and half of last year, all of our summer camp revenue for 2020, and significantly reduced earned revenue from our memberships, programs, and sales, totaling hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue shortages due to COVID. PPP has certainly been a lifesaver but there are still significant shortfalls. I believe the federal CARES funding was off their community's best, could disperse it to help alleviate some of the financial stress this pandemic has caused. Our nonprofit businesses have worked very hard to trim expenses and have continuously adjusted the way we do business to offer our services to the fullest extent possible to our fellow residents throughout this crisis. Our charitable nonprofits feed, heal, shelter, educate, inspire, enlighten, and nurture people of every age, gender, race, and socioeconomic status. We foster civic engagement and leadership, drive economic growth, and strengthen the fabric of our communities every single day. The work of our exceptional and vital nonprofits is a large part of what makes our community so special. Residents rely on us now and will rely on us to be standing strong when we emerge together on the other side of this challenge. I would respectfully ask this commission to explore ways to equitably include small nonprofits in CARES funding distribution through one-time forgiven grants of five to ten thousand dollars. There has been no con comparable distribution of funds in this manner to our nonprofits. This support will reduce some of the tremendous stress that we have all felt this past year and will continue to feel in 2021. I thank you sincerely for your service and for all that you do for our community and for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Ms. Schlitt, uh, have you taken the opportunity to apply for any of the available grants in the past the um which grants would that be the united way ones so the united way which was is actual COVID money that was granted given to the united way for disbursement with the 501c3s so the we were made aware of the opportunity of that funding it was specifically limited to um safety procedures such as providing PPE, sanitizing equipment, acrylic shields, um, and you know, like sanitizing devices for air handlers. 
Um, so there was no funding that I'm aware of that was made available that was to defray general operating. Well, that's not the case. It was made available for other reasons, and we have other 501c trees that were did have the opportunity and did partake. And there is a lot of funds available through uh, the uh, United Way as they are fully prepared to be able to distribute, and that is COVID funding. And uh, th there is quite, quite a bit of upgrades that you can do with that funding. It may not be for day-to-day -day operations, but it is available, and we have dispersed quite a bit of it. I think we can ask Jason about the, the accounting of the amount that has been mm -hmm. distributed. So I wanted you to reconsider or revisit. I am aware of United Way um, CARES funding that was made available to nonprofits that, sp that provide basic human needs, such as food, housing assistance. But there are many of our nonprofits that don't provide the basic human needs services. So, yes, I am aware of the grants, you know, for food banks and housing assistance, um, utility bills, things like that, that were made available. If if that's what you're referring to. And I guess what I'm referring to is the general operating revenue such that the five to $10,000 um, forgiven grants were provided to other small businesses in our community. And we would just ask that our small nonprofits be viewed as local businesses, which we are, and um, that we also be afforded that opportunity. And regarding the PPE, uh, did, did you participate with the payroll protection program? We did receive PPP. Yes, we did. And um, that was a significant lifesaver for us, but we still have shortfalls. And you had asked a couple of other people about fundraisers. We are entering into ours now. <clears throat> and we you know, have pivoted to kind of a hybrid event that has virtual and some live components. We do generally net about $110,000 on our fundraiser, and we anticipate netting 35 to 40 this year based on our revised um, budgets that we've prepared. So uh, we have had very generous donors that have helped to make up some shortfalls and we appreciate everything that this community does for us. We just really would like for the commission to um, view us as vital small businesses in our community and be afforded the um, one-time forgiven grants that other businesses were for general operating losses. I have a question. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. I have a question for you. Um, I know the ELC and primarily your programs are conducted outside, open air. Um, so can you speak to how you were unable to do that last year? Because I know this summer you're already gearing up to program your summer, um, summer camps. Because I think actually uh, registration opened yesterday and then on the 8th for non-members. So can you speak to how you've, your programs have been impacted? Sure. We have really adjusted it and pivoted and morphed and really tried to provide our services in every way that we possibly could throughout this whole ordeal. Um, we have been able to run small group um, outdoor activities and so we limit those to 10 people. Um, so we have had to cut our group sizes about in half and really generally that's where the profit occurs is in the second half so we've been able to kind of offset some of our basic costs there but not generate any of the profit that we normally would we um, the school district was not comfortable in um, you know they were not allowing field trips that's a significant contract that we have and so half of our field trips last year weren't able to occur and none of our field trips this year because the school district wasn't um, willing to bring them. It was just not uh, something that they considered to be a good idea to take kids off campus for field trips. So all of that revenue was lost. The summer camps last year were canceled because it was just really in the, um, 
you know, the midst of this quarantining safety protocols, and we didn't feel it was responsible to run them last year. However, this year with the numbers being reduced, we are moving forward fully with our summer camps, although we are again keeping our group sizes to no more than 10. Um, and with masks when within six feet or indoors. And so again, we will be able to offer that service to the community, but because of the really reduced group size, we lose our profit margin on those programs. But um, so you're still conducting the programs, they're just on a reduced basis. Uh, except all of our all right. field trips were lost and that's a significant portion of our income yeah, our pontoon trips are at half capacity, so. Um, I think you did some of your Christmas light kayak yes. tours and stuff we like did. that too. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, we've continued all that we possibly could. It's a great place for people to be, is outside in the fresh air. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I can see that there are a number of questions regarding uh, United Way, so I, I don't know if the my colleagues on the commission um, have a copy of the list. I, uh, I uh, maybe we can have copies made because it shows this. And by the way, the list is from United Way, um, from Meredith Egan, and I received it within the last few days. But what it shows uh, very clearly is that uh, the the and this it goes up to a million dollars being distributed. But you, when you look at it, you'll see. And I, I highlighted a lot of them, not every single one, but it's uh, largely. And I, I'm reading now from the list, this is, this is the description, this is their category. Their category is preventing COVID spread, retrofitting and technology. That's a, a very large category that uh, many organizations uh, were covered on. And also technology for distance learning and teleworking. Uh, that's another large category. And in addition to that, there were hand sanitizers and uh, thermometers. Um, special needs support for telehealth, um, technology for distance learning. It was, um, yeah, this is to give you an idea, and I don't know how we go about having a copy made for everyone at the moment, but. Well, it uh, would have probably been appropriate to include it in your agenda packet, but since it's not, I do have a copy of that. Oh, okay, and it's much wonderful. more than just crisis support or COVID retrofitting, it's feeding support, there's pet food support, there's food access support, special needs for children, crisis management support, veterans assistance, yes. preventing COVID spread, retrofitting of technology, prescription assistance. I mean, it, and this was part of the priorities that we set. So I know you have other people here to speak. I think yes. it would be best to have everybody speak that you want to speak so then we can have a discussion amongst the board. Okay. Because we're kind of, you're kind of getting all over the place here. Okay, well. Pass that out. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, well, I have one copy. But at any rate, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Heather Stapleton, Heritage Center and Citrus Museum Director. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to those of us representing the nonprofit community. My name is Heather Stapleton. I'm the Executive Director of Vero Heritage, Inc. We have the distinct pleasure of stewarding the Heritage Center on 14th Ave as well as operating the one and only Indian River Citrus Museum. So just as COVID has made small businesses financially vulnerable, it's done the same as we have heard to many local nonprofits. Um, yet the small nonprofits, which operate much like businesses, haven't been afforded the same consideration of an operating grant. Um, yes, Vero Heritage did qualify and received a grant from United Way. It was specifically for COVID prevention technology. We were not allowed to use that as unrestricted funds, meaning we did get money and it could only be used for COVID prevention technology, which is amazing to have for sure, but does not contribute to our bottom line. It doesn't make up for all of the money that we have lost. Um, we have had to cut our operating budget by one over one third at this point. My small nonprofit has had over 77 cancellations for rentals and we continue to take cancellations. Um, I think the general public is starting, starting to feel a little bit safer with events, but they're not 
feeling safe as to bring in um, family from outside of the area and a lot of events that would happen at the Heritage Center are things like weddings, family reunions, such. And so there's just not a lot of travel going on. And so 77 cancellations, you know, in, in a mere 11 months is huge for us. Um, we're doing everything we can to cut our expenses. The last time I was here, I told you we were even unplugging our refrigerators um, when not in use, when not rented. We are unplugging all of our appliances now um, when we can. And in fact, un very unfortunately, we've even had to cancel recycling pickup at my facility. We just can't afford, we are, we are charged the business rate for recycling. We don't get a residential rate for recycling. And so we have even had to cancel that now, just trying to figure out how do we be the best stewards of what little income we do have coming in. Nonprofit museums are a very robust and diverse sector, especially locally. We have art museums, we have botanic gardens, we have children's museums, we have culturally specific museums, we have historical societies, history museums, nature centers, railway museums. Most of these museums rely on earned revenue from visitors coming in through our doors. That's our, our economic lifeblood is people visiting. And unfortunately, you can't do a curbside pickup for people visiting like some businesses might have done. Um, though we continue to pivot so much, I feel like we're doing a pirouette um, that sometimes feels like it's going to get out of control with so much pivoting. So, for example, we have tried some online fundraisers, and they've, they've been okay. They have not replicated what we've had to cancel, that's for sure, but, but it's something. Um, we've been selling masks, and believe it or not, this is one of our best fundraisers, is the citrus print masks available at the museum. We also sold unique jigsaw puzzles. It's interesting in that jigsaw puzzles first became popular during the Great Depression of the 30s. The Heritage Center was built in the 30s. Jigsaw puzzles are having a resurgence in popularity thanks to COVID. So we have tried to do as much pivoting as we can to continue supporting ourselves, but, but there becomes a point when it's it just becomes very difficult. We, we applied for both rounds of PPP and we received both rounds of PPP. And for that, I'm exceptionally grateful, but that's 16 weeks out of 52 weeks that have been supported. Small nonprofits and museums are in need of more support to maintain our jobs, secure our cultural heritage, help to rebuild the tourism industry um, I know that locally we aren't doing as bad as, as some with tourism, and um, we hope to help with that. But honestly, we need support to simply survive. We've had the conversation, what happens if we close our doors? The American Alliance of Museums recently released survey data showing that one out of every three museums are likely to shutter their doors due to COVID. Like our small businesses, nonprofits can use every bit of support that you might be able to afford to us. Uh, and I, I, I feel pretty strongly, especially after hearing everyone's um, more detailed stories today, um, that Indian River County could certainly use a small nonprofit recovery grant program similar to that of the small business recovery grant program. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to uh, extend an invitation to Mr. Freddie Wolfolk of uh, Gifford Youth Achievement Center. Um, God bless, especially thankful to see you here today. Gifford Youth Achievement Center uh, for the commissioners might not even qualify for this if the criteria is 25 for the uh, full-time employee equivalent. Um, Gifford Youth Achievement Center might actually have 25.5, um, that would have to be confirmed, but the, they might miss it by 0.5. So th thank you for being here. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Freddie. Good, Good to morning. be here. I, I don't have to tell you about Gifford Youth Achievement Center. We've been around now, I, my, matter of fact, my employer has been there almost 24 years. And what we do, we constantly focus on the after-school program, but we're more than an after-school program because we consider ourselves a community center. 
uh, as I was doing a talk show piece this morning with Bob Seuss on WTTB, I mentioned how nonprofits are so essential and how we need those nonprofits to continue to exist fervently and provide the services that they uh, bring forth. Uh, I saw a documentary on television that kind of explained what the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, sure. as well as other nonprofits, provide. This big, big barge, this big ship was trying to go through this, this canal, and as it was turning, it realized that it could not make the complete 90 degree turn that it needed to without some assistance. And as I watched this big ship, and, and the ship that I'm talking about is some of our bigger uh, fund, funders who provide resources to her, how they are big ships. They have the cargo that we need. They have all the essentials that we need. And they do provide. But this turn needed some little tugboats. And the little tugboats are the nonprofits that help that big ship to turn that corner. When right now the Gifford Youth Achievement Center uh, we are helping with the health department, big ship. Church of Coast Community Health, big, big ship. But we are helping with uh, signing people up for vaccination that who could not otherwise, the only way we can do that because uh, we, are, we are provided the expertise from those bigger ships to offer to those citizens, those 88 year olds, those 90 year olds who cannot make that turn on their own. So that little tugboat GYC is teaming up with Treasure Coast Community Health, Indian River Health Department, uh, whole family, uh, you name all those different. So that tugboat scenario really stuck home with me. These nonprofits provide a solid direction when you as a, as a big organization or they as a big an organization paint a broad picture. And that's good and we love it. The picture is broad and it looks good, the paint looks good, but you need someone to come along with a little smaller brush and that's those nonprofits to fill in the little gaps that the big brush could not uh, take care of. So I'm, I'm not trying to, trying to paint a picture that, that's not realistic. Uh, the Gifford Achievement Center, as I said, does that. Uh, matter of fact, this past week, uh, we've teamed up with Indian River County Parks and Rec, Mr. Kevin uh, Curran, also with uh, Jillian Sparks and others, and helping to provide screen on the green. Well, what did that have to do? Well, it's an opportunity for a little nonprofit to reach out its tentacles into the community and say, families, I know you're going through a lot with all the COVID-19 problems, all the shortcoming of finances. Take a night for yourself and take a breather and come out to the screen on the green at Gifford Park, now known as the Victor Hart Senior uh, Enhancement Complex. Come out, get a blanket and watch the kid. That means that's, that's better than any medicine that you can think of. So what I'm saying is that these little nonprofits uh, provide a service that I'm sure that you consider important, and we're just simply asking you to give us a little shot in the arm so we can grease the wheels to turn those corners a little bit easier so the big bars can make it to safe territory. Thank you so much. Freddie, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for being all you do. And, uh, and thank you. Those are, those are the speakers that I had invited formally. Um, I think we probably have others in the audience. Um, I did discuss uh, financing with the, our county administrator, so perhaps uh, he would like to comment uh, on that. So um, big picture, the CARES Act dollars, we have allocated um, nearly all of the funds out of the 27 million, there's about 175,000 left. Um, so any new program, we would have to identify funding from one of the existing categories that we have. Um, I will say that staff is planning on bringing an update back because we've had a couple of overruns in a, in, 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 in a few categories. Um, the first of which is the small business uh, grants we set aside 2.3 million for that. Um, uh, the, uh, the the Chamber of Commerce who is helping us with that, along with the Small Business Development Center, uh, reached out to us a couple weeks ago and said, "Whoa, I think we've got all the applications we we can fund." Um, we basically suspended that program. Um, however, not before more people got in the door than than we had money for. So, 
Um, we have 2.3 million allocated to that. The the applications that are that are in house at the either the chamber or the small business development center um, is about 340 thousand more than what we have. So we've got to come back. I believe we should at least fund that. Um, and if and then we need to make a determination: do we open that program back up because there was ongoing application? So that could be additional dollars. Um, our vaccination efforts have been more expensive than than we thought. Um, so uh, we, we we need some additional dollars there. We have some other areas where we will. Um, the health department is actually, I believe, is going to return some of the funds that we have provided to them for vaccinations because they've gotten some other dollars. Um, I think we can fund most of that stuff from within some of those categories. Um, the biggest, uh, if we were to move forward with a new program like this, um, the best the best source I would say would be the mortgage and rental assistance uh, program. We have provided, or the, the allocation is four and a half million. We have uh, provided a little over a million out of the CARES Act dollars. We also got some specific CRF dollars for housing that we spent about three or 400,000 of those on. So we have some dollars that haven't been expended there. Um, we are a little concerned about that because, you know, there's been a, an eviction moratorium that's, that's been in place. If that goes away, we could have, we could, we could see a, a rise, rise in applications there. Um, we could bring, bring something back. Um, on that um, uh, as, as far as as far as funding. But if, if we were to move forward with this, I, I think we need to take care of those other things. You know, we, we need to make sure that we're taking care of the small business um, assistance program uh, as there's some applicants on hold right now. Um, and uh, and and the, uh, the the vaccine costs, which I think we can fund from within like those health department. We've had some other uh, areas that we've underexpended in. If we were to move forward with this, I think we'd have to look at those mortgage and rental assistance dollars because we're under, or significantly under on that right now. Um, uh, as far as the 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 size of this, you know, that's that's one question. You know, in the backup, there's like 900 and some nonprofits. Uh, this program, it seems like that would be open to all nonprofits, which was different than our small business assistance. It was limited to certain industries. We didn't provide assistance to industries that were having a great year, like real estate or boat sales. I hear if you're if you're in the boat business, things business is really good. Um, so we didn't provide assistance to those industries. Um, just just concerned about the scope. There's 900 uh, plus, according to this list. Um, some of those will have over over 25, but the vast majority are probably under 25 employees. They may not all apply, um, but we we need to be aware of the total the total uh, magnitude of, of what could be there. If 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 you had half of those apply, that's four and a half million dollars at ten thousand dollars a piece. So um, I don't believe we've got that much money that we could find within within the within the dollars, um, and maybe maybe the demand would be less than that, but. It is opening, opening this up, to, you know. And one of the things that we've tried to do with a small business, one was was limit that. Um, I just, you know, pulled up a, a a site that's that's got a listing of of nonprofits in Indian River County, and it actually says 1,500. Um, and the first one on the list is 16 Green Acres is the name of the organization, and it's located at what looks to be a, I would guess is. 2016 Gray Falcon Circle Southwest. So I think that's a home in Falcon Trace uh, is the location of that nonprofit. I, I, we need to be careful about um, um, w who would be uh, eligible for this. I, I, I believe um, so. So uh, we, we may we may need to look at some some things like that. That is, I don't know what 16 Green Acres does. Maybe they're a great organization. Um, but uh, that was just the first one on the list. So um, so I want to be careful with, with what we do there. But um, long story short, I would say that we would, we would allocate funds from the uh, mortgage and rental assistance program uh, if, 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 if the board decides to, to move forward on, on a program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jason, it's too early to tell about the 
maybe the the Biden plan, the incoming the 1.9 trillion that's being distributed throughout the United States. So, yeah, the stimulus that uh, the Biden plan, the 1.9 trillion dollars, um, has some state and local government assistance in the version that the House passed. I don't know what makes it through the Senate or what what does that, but there could be additional dollars um, that come down in the future from from the feds. Um, may I say something? Okay. Sure. We did, um, thanks. Uh, I did include as part of the materials that were uploaded uh, some metrics, and that, of course, uh, you know, could be tweaked. Uh, that's why I mentioned when Mr. Wolfolk was coming forward that it was uh, limited to organizations with less than 25 uh, uh, full time employee equivalents. So, um, you know, we can work on that in terms of the metrics to limit it. Um, we can, you know, I, I think that uh, Mr. Brown was planning to come back anyway, our county administrator, with, with an update on, on CARES uh, funding, you know, what's been expended. I just wanted to be sure that everyone understood that it's, this is not a duplication of, of anything, with all due respect to United Way, it's, it's not a duplication of anything that's been done previously. I mean, no one needs to go out at this point and spend $5,000 on hand sanitizers or, or an air filter. I mean, we're, you know, we're a year into this now, uh, almost a year. Uh, be a year in March, to my to my knowledge, and you know, God bless them. You know, it's been it, it's been a rough year for them. It's not a lot of money. Um, we, uh, I think we all probably probably recall we started at five thousand for the small business. I think that's out. That sounds fine. Start at five thousand, and you, and of course you're just you're going to start with a budget. So you do it first come first serve, which is what happened with uh, small business. That's what we're looking at right now. We didn't have any takers in the beginning, which you know surprised me at the time. Or, or had, I shouldn't say didn't have any, but we didn't have as many as we might have expected. Um, I can't predict what will happen with the small nonprofits. Maybe it'll be a similar situation that you know we're offering money and we, we won't have too many takers. But I you know I don't um, I don't have any objection to starting at, at five thousand. I just I, I uh, just so that there's no misunderstanding. I'm I'm looking at this, and please help me if you will, um, to make this akin to the small business grant program. That's all. I'm I'm just looking for this to be a, a as close as we can get to what we offered as small business assistance to the small nonprofits. Um, I I would I. I would like to accord them the same courtesy, the same the same respect, and and the same importance that we that we have previously shown to to our small businesses. So I'm I'm asking for your help. You know, my my, my fellow commissioners. You know what 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 can what can we do? You know, for the small nonprofits, I, I don't think we can we can just leave them and say, well, we gave you the, you know we got you got your hand sanitizers and and, and you're done. Um, that's not, uh, you know, and you, and you have the list. It's all, it's, it's all t a technology, you know, retrofitting, and, and it was all good. It was all good at the time. I'm, actually, I'm not even sure that the timing was good because they got this at a time when if they were indoors, people weren't coming to them. So, I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not even sure that it was, um, it was a huge help to them at the time that they got that, but that was decided for them. Um, I don't know that they were asked uh, specifically what their needs were. That was decided for them. So I'm, I'm asking for your help in terms of fashioning a program that's affordable. You know, I've, I've, as I said, I've, I've spoken with the county administrator previously. I wouldn't just come to you, uh, you know, with an idea with, with, with no funding. And it appears that there, there will be funding and there might be additional funding uh, beyond what we know about today. And, that, and that's not my opinion, that was discussed with the county administrator, and that was his opinion. And if I'm misquoting him, he can say so. But, uh, but at any rate, I'm asking for your help with this. Would you like to answer that, Jason? Well, I th yeah, I, th I mean, I think in general, we can, you know, we can make some funds available from the rental and mortgage assistance if the board decides to do that. Um, and there may be funds, additional funds coming down from, from the federal government if this next uh, 
stimulus passes in its in its current form. So you you would, if this were to go forward, and you would have to take away from the rental and mortgage assistance. Th that's about the only place I see we're basically whittling down everything to fund the the we're 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 kind of having to clean out the other accounts for funding the remainder of the small business assistance and the vaccination costs there's some other minor costs some you know fifty thousand dollars for the sheriffs and things like that um that are that that I think we can fund without getting into the the mortgage and rental assistance if we take on a new program like this I I, the cupboard is bare by the time we take care of those other things the, for existing programs that we've got. So I think the 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 only viable option for a significant amount of dollars, if we're talking about like a million dollars or something like that, would be would be the mortgage and rental assistance program. And where, where do we stand with the mortgage and rental assistance as far as the the flow? I and mean, you know uh, there has been some adjustments as we're. Uh, getting ahead of the curve, but what has happened with rent, uh, with mortgage and uh, rental assistance? So we got a large amount of applications when it f when it first came out. We've worked our way through that. Uh, we continue to have those applications coming in. Um, we are currently, you know, per the, as as discussed with the board, uh, putting the notices in the in the uh, in the utility bills that that the funding is available. Um, and there may be there may be an uptick, you know, ba based on that. Um, and uh, and and like I said, there's you know, one of the worries we have is at some point that eviction moratorium is going to go away, and that may lead to a to a a, an, an, a resurgence of of, uh, of applications for 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 that program. But right now, it's it's kind of at a at a moderate pace with just you know applications coming in but not near like they were at the beginning thank you um, so just for purposes of clarification then um, no one is would be deprived of anything what you're seeing right now is a, is a surplus if you will in the, in that category surplus of funds right now we we are we are well under the amount that is there um, we haven't seen that there's a a that, that we're going to run out of funds imminently on that. Okay. With the caveat that, you know, if something could happen when the, when the eviction moratoriums go away, I saw there was like some kind of challenge to that, like in Texas or something, talking about whether it's constitutional or not. So I don't know where all that stuff stands. Um, and that could bring a new sense of urgency to people that, that had, hadn't, had not applied previously. So we're a little worried about that. Cautiously optimistic that we've got enough funds there um, with the caveat that, that something could change if 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 the if the eviction moratorium goes away. Council, did you have something? I, I I just at least want to put this thought on the table. Um, we heard from a lot of great not for profits today, a lot of organizations that do a lot of really wonderful things in our community, and there are lots of really great other organizations in our community who are doing fantastic things, especially during these very hard times. It just hits me that I just want the board to think about at least as we go into deliberation of this is we all donate to and support causes that we think are really important to us. Um, and, and those are really important things that each individual does. But we have to recognize, and I'm just trying to figure out from an operational standpoint, if it's the board's decision to task us to figuring out how the operations work out, that's great. But there are probably not-for-profit organizations out there that may be doing things that may not be consistent with some of our personal views, some of our personal philosophies and the like. And, and I don't know how we would deal with, the, essentially those types of issues would be gone and I just don't want there to be a question at some point that the county gave $5,000 to this entity or that entity when that may not be the type of, you know, they might not share our 
philosophical views, our political views, our social views. And, and we've got to be in a place that if we're going to do something like this, that we all understand the ramification that we're not going to be able to make those types of distinctions. Um, and so there may be organizations that get funded that we otherwise personally, or even as a board may have disagreed with in the past, had disputes with in the past um, or, and the like. So I just kind of want that to be kind of as we look about doing this program and how we operational do it, that we keep that in mind. So thank you. And Council, um, that was the very foundation of the decision to allocate the funding to the United Way, which would have a, a broader brush of assessment and uh, uh, evenly distribute to all applicants, correct? I know we tasked you not away with the responsibility of kind of handling the not-for-profit front, um, but I just, that's all. And it's, it's yeah. something we may be able to work through, but I just, I just want to make sure we, we, we think through that issue. Um, well, just, just as a as a comment to your comment, uh, political and re political and religious organizations are already excluded from applying for this. That uh, that appears um, in what was uploaded with the information uh, for this item. So their political and religious organizations already are excluded. And if there are other categories that should be excluded, then you know certainly uh, would be amenable to that. And thank you for mentioning it. Okay. Jason, the the <clears throat> the United Way only funded the PPE and the payroll protection, and that that was that that's all the United Way did. No, no. What, else, what, what was their criteria? In other words, I guess what I'm seeing, I'm I seeing this is more of an operational need for the for the 501c3s. You know, to to because you lost your fundraising and and things like that, which obviously is not a good thing. It, it is, in other words, where's the where's the, the breaking point from what United Way did to what we can do? I mean, I don't want to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. Right. So you know, we 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 chose United Way to help disperse these dollars because that's what they do. They're a funding agency that 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 identifies the needs, and 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 provides funding to nonprofits to help further those community needs. So a lot of the things they did. We're not focused specifically on the nonprofits themselves, but on the on the clients of the nonprofits. So, you know, food, you know, food pantry, the Indian River Food Pantry, United Against Poverty, um, things like that. The dog dog food um, for the love of paws, Halo, things like that. They gave out money for um, diapers and formula to organizations like uh, like the Buggy Bunch that 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 disperse those dollars. Um, mental health was one of the things that we identified up front that that was a concern um, they provided support to like the mental health association to support the um, the the them providing mental health services to people in need um, a lot was mentioned about the technology some of the t technology and distance learning one of the things that uh, was was a concern early on in this was schools were closed schools were last you know, when, when we were looking at this, um, schools were closed, closed um, last year um, and helping distance learning like Redland Christian Migrant Association, helping helping um, disadvantaged communities where the where they might need assistance with with uh, technology so that they could do the distance learning, um, trying to help agencies that do their own things like an ELC or something like that could 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 maybe do a distance learning type type of events that might not translate as well for some some entities as others um and then to the to the um point of just support for the agencies then it became things like PPE um various retrofits for sanitizing uh, things like that to help them do their operations. They didn't have a something like what's talked about here. Hey, we just need ten thousand um, dollars. So it's 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 not. I, I don't think it's fair to calculate it as just they bought hand sanitizer for for nonprofits. There were a lot of things they were doing. The uh, it, the largest thing they did was they also did mortgage and rental assistance through three partners. Um, so you know there was there was a lot of a lot of um, a lot of different things that were done. I believe um, that I, 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 
per, per Meredith Egan from the United Way, they didn't flat out turn anyone down that came to them. They funded them for their eligible expenses. Now, the direction we gave to the United Way was to make sure that these were CARES Act dollars, so everything had to be COVID related and CARES Act related. So, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I want to make sure. I believe that United Way has done an excellent job for us. You know, we asked them to do a lot during this, and they've done it for not a, really their own gain, um, but for the community. So I, 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 I want to, I want to make sure we're not characterizing anything that the United Way has done as, as not not being sufficient. I think they've done a done a done a tremendous job of allocating the dollars for the betterment of the community. I think they're better at doing it than us, which is kind of why we picked them to to kind of be the 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 centerpiece of that and, and to kind of work with all of those nonprofits because that's what they have experience in doing. Um, so th some of this stuff is, you know, is the PPE and, 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 uh, and things like that retrofits to make facilities more, more safe. Um, but, uh, the vast majority of what they did was actually to, to provide support to agencies so that they could fulfill their mission, whether it's dog food or, um, people food or, or, or other, other needs, uh, like mental, mental health. So, um, so, so I would be, I would be proper to say that this is, this is, this is kind of like, I heard some of the speakers say that they, you know, one should be considered like a business and, and I don't disagree with that. This is more of an operational need on, on y'all's part to, uh, maybe help supplement fundraising efforts that you've done, things of that nature. And I know some, you know, so some of, of you are, are totally dependent on fundraisers. You don't receive maybe grants or, or, or say TDC money or something of that nature. So, that, that I just want to get it right in my mind and make sure that everybody's clear on that. That we're we're talking to, we're pretty much talking about two separate things. With that, Commissioner Moss, would that be what um, you're looking at here? Yes, and 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 thank you for actually for clarifying. This is not intended to be a duplication of anything that United Way has done previously. And you know, as I I think I stated right up front, we're thankful for the assistance of United Way. Um, appreciate all their efforts. This is not intended to be a duplication. United Way did not, uh, you know, offer a program to the nonprofits similar to the program that we offer to the uh, business, you know, the small business grant assistance. And that's, that's all I'm trying to do here is to mirror, if you will, the small business grant assistance program that we had, which was uh, not a large dollar amount. And, you, and I think you probably remember in the beginning we had very few takers. We can do it on a first come, first serve basis we can set a total amount and when it's gone it's gone um you know but i, I just uh, i can't see how we do nothing for the nonprofits in terms of uh, or as compared to what we did for small business which i'm very happy about i think you know small business and small nonprofit they're the backbone and they're the heart of the community and I think, I think we need to support them both uh, with the same respect. And that's all I'm asking for. I'm asking for your help in doing this. Thank you. Jason, I just had a question. We've already taken a break, but it's been requested. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask a question about the, the comparison. We're hearing a comparison between businesses and nonprofits. And do you, do you have a, a dollar amount on what we've done for loss of revenue granting for uh, customary businesses? So um, the, the small business assistance program, uh, a re reduction in revenues was, was something that if you you're made you eligible you know, we've, we've, we allocated 2.3. Well, I'll say 2.2 is us, 120,000 is from the city of Vero. They allocated 120,000 of their allocation to us. So the total between the two is 2,370,000. Um, and that's, that's all been spent. So, um, and then there's the other 300,000 sitting there. Uh, and that was consistent with the SBA allocation? Yes. 
Okay. All right, uh, folks, we're going to take a, a brief recess and then continue this discussion. Thank you.
Thank you. Got another vote. They all need more and more. more, more. <laughs> What? Okay. What am I doing? <laughs> yes. Just about there? You all ready, commissioners? Mm -hmm. The meeting will now be called back to order, and uh, we'll continue with the discussion. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, our uh, one and only Dory Stone from the Chamber of Commerce is on the internet. She's not here present, and she has a message for us. If you'd like to include that in the presentation. I would like you to consider adding 501c6 to this plan. Unlike 501c3 organizations, we were not el eligible for PPP funding in the first round. We were also affected by the pandemic and could use this level of support. Thank you. I, I was, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say in response to that, um, what was uploaded with the materials for this item, that was, that was the start of a determination of criteria and, you know, I was looking for input, of course, sure. you know, from, from everyone, you know, from my colleagues here. Um, so I would, you know, I would leave that for your consideration and also with the county administrator. I think perhaps, uh, and, you know, if there's other, other discussion, I'm happy to hear it, but uh, I think at this point, what I, what I would propose to do or what I would wish to do is to uh, direct the staff to, um, to pursue this further, to, uh, to look at it in terms of the criteria, to look at it in terms of the funding, and to come back to us uh, with something, with a proposal uh, that has um, uh, you know, additional facts. And if you want to add to those facts right here and now, you know, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, but I would, I'd, I would like to, to move this forward even if we don't have the same, I, I, we're obviously not going to have the same amount of funding that we had for the small businesses. I, I, I'm not expecting that. Um, but as I, as I said earlier, to accord the same uh, courtesy, respect, and support that was shown to the small businesses, I would like to do a similar program, support a similar program, as close as, as close as we can get it to the small business assistance program. And w yes, we need to um, uh, determine the details, and I'm, I'm gonna leave that to, to staff to do. I'm not, I'm not dictating you know, details, and, and of course all of us uh, you know, will be speaking with staff we can add some right now or, you know, at your leisure. Uh, but I would, I would like to see staff bring something back to us, a proposal for small nonprofit grant assistance. Would you like to? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to that effect if, we're, if this is a good time. I don't want to cut anybody off, and if anybody else wants to discuss it, I'm happy to hear it. But otherwise, I'll, I'll make that motion. Well, it, it's entirely up to you. Uh, that's why I uh, asked if you would like to hear from your fellow commissioners or you would like to go forward with a motion. I, I'd be happy to hear anything that anyone would like to say. Your see. choice. I'd be happy to hear. Okay. Thank you. Uh, commissioners? Sure. <clears throat> I have a few comments to make. Um, first of all, no one has said or is saying that nonprofits are not important to our community or that we don't support them. They're very important to our community. I've been involved in numerous nonprofits across the board for many, many years. And the fact is that we fund most of them through different vehicles, either TDC, CSAC, or through direct funding in our budgetary process. 
CARES Act dollars are not intended to make people whole, either through small businesses and those programs, individual assistance, or nonprofits. It's taxpayer dollars intended as a bridge to help people and organizations get through an emergency situation. It's not intended to fill all the holes in, in, in any one person or organization's budget. I think it's unfortunate and inappropriate and honestly not fair to the nonprofits that are here today to have asked them to come to us and ask for dollars for funding that doesn't exist. There is no funding source available for this. And the commissioners haven't even had the opportunity to discuss and consider a funding source. We have holes and shortfalls in our current programs that we have to figure out how to fill. And that should be our priority before we start creating new programs. We've spent our dollars on our priorities, which have included rent and mortgage assistance, small business support, vaccine distribution, municipal and constitutional officer support, and we've also allocated dollars for nonprofits for PPE, technology, and other COVID-related retrofits that they may need to continue their programs. I know that St. Lucie and Martin County's programs have been listed as possible templates to use, but even their programs do not fund revenue shortfalls. In fact, reading specifically from the St. Lucie County Nonprofit and Faith-Based Organizational Assistance Program, it says funding for revenue loss due to COVID is an ineligible expense under this program. Both of those programs are set up similar to the program we have being administered by the United Way. And in fact, the St. Lucie program is administered by the St. Lucie County United Way. Those programs are also reimbursable. So you must spend the dollars before you're reimbursed for them. <clears throat> I personally wouldn't want to take money away from the rental and mortgage assistance program because I feel at the end of the moratorium when it is lifted, then we are going to have a crisis on our hands that we are going to be that we are going to need to address. I would suggest that we revisit this issue with the next round of CARES Act dollars and distribution. <clears throat> because right now the monies that we have available, we need to use to address the current holes in the programs we've already created. I think that we are gonna get some dollars through the, a second round through the CARES Act. I know there's some political um, things working through right now, but it seems that we will get some type of dollars. And if we want to revisit that, revisit the nonprofit issue, um, at that point, I would not have a problem with it. I do have a problem with it now because we really need to address what is lacking in our existing programs. I understand, I mean, again, serve on several boards of nonprofit boards right now, and I understand the needs and the concern. I, I truly do. We're going through that in many of the nonprofits I serve on. Um, I just feel like we have set a pri we have set priorities as a commission. Um, and that's how we were going to spend that initial round. And if this needs to be a priority in the second round, then we can do that, but it's a little premature to have that discussion at this point. Um, I do have some questions and concerns about the fact that there's really no criteria that's been included in this backup package. Um, and when and if we get to the point that we want to talk about a program like this, um, there needs to be a much more in-depth discussion about what type of nonprofit would qualify. For instance, um, the Sebastian River Clambake is a nonprofit. They were not able to have their event last year. They're planning to have their event this year, but should they qualify? And then when you start getting into um, some of the other nonprofits that might not be addressing community needs, specifically for those people that have been hurt, but might be more overall umbrella organizations. How do you differentiate? And if you're going to open it up for a first come first serve, how are you going to ensure that the really hard hit 
nonprofits or the ones that are most at need have been the ones that received the dollars versus the ones that were just quick to fill out the application because that's not going to help what you're trying to get at. So I think that this proposal needs a lot more um, work and it needs a lot more detail before we can determine what we want to do moving forward. But for me at this point, I would not be in favor of taking dollars from the rental and mortgage assistance program. And I would prefer to discuss this um, nonprofit support when we know how much we're going to get from the second round of disbursements. That is all. That is all. Thank you. Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to kind of reiterate, obviously, we, and I tell people this all the time when I talk about Indian River County, that um, we have such a philanthropic community that that is what makes Vero Beach and Indian River County special. And I always mention, you know, we, we've got the big sexy things like the theater and the art museum and things like that. But we have a whole lot more smaller nonprofits like Safe Space and a lot of the folks that spoke here today that elevate us beyond a lot of other communities. So I certainly appreciate and realize the positive impact that all the nonprofits have on our community, both big and small. I think probably before, well, certainly before Commissioner Moss and Airman, I'm not sure about Commissioner Adams, but a while back the board made a decision that we were not going to fund nonprofits through taxpayer dollars in the general fund and I think we only Jason correct me if I'm wrong but I think we only have three right now that we still fund and I know a few years back we also made a policy decision that we're going to cap any additional funding to those agencies on the, the inflation rate that we weren't going to make big substantial increases in the funding is that correct Mike? yeah that's correct I, I believe it's three i believe you're right that we're kind of grandfathered if you will right and we said we're not going to take any any ad additional applications from other nonprofits in the future and we weren't going to increase those any more than like the cpi rate so. each year yes so that, that that's where i'm a little bit torn um as i mentioned earlier i, I greatly appreciate the work all the nonprofits do but um, sitting here, we need to be fiduciaries of, of taxpayer dollars. Um, I will say this, you know, I think a lot of nonprofits have adjusted that they've come up with alternate fundraisers. Um, I know one nonprofit I know of, my, my neighbor runs it, and instead of their big 120-person um, annual dinner, which was their main event, they broke it down and board members hosted small dinner parties 10 at a time to achieve their fundraising events. So those were little things they could still do in person, you know, have everybody to a board member's house, outside food. They brought in a celebrity chef to kind of give it a little bit of spice, but they were able to do their fundraising goals. Um, the nonprofits usually have a very strong volunteer and donor base and I don't know how anybody else feels right now but to me this town this community has been jam-packed with our snowbirds for the last two months and just going out and about um, there's a lot of these donors a lot of these supporters in town and I think they should be tapped um, kind of like it's Dylan mentioned you know People support what they believe in, and so I think for the nonprofits, for them to go to their donor base, go to their volunteers, and really bang on those doors hard um, might be the more appropriate uh, path to follow. And then today we, we heard from some nonprofits that are they're struggling, and I understand that. We also heard from a couple that said they're doing pretty well, that their dollars are the same as, as uh, previous year that the, their, the pet food donations are up, and a couple of them talked about expanding. And I certainly don't think we want to use taxpayer dollars on expanding of these programs. I share a lot of the concerns that uh, Commissioner Adams mentioned as far as the funding and whether it's appropriate now to come up with a new uh, program 
when we've already pretty much allocated all the CARES Act dollars we have. I also have concerns that were expressed about how do we really narrow, winnow the list to those nonprofits that most need it. Um, I know we, we heard from Heather today and uh, you know, it, it sounds like your all dollars are very tight. And if I was going to help a nonprofit, that would be what I would be looking for, a, a very small nonprofit with a small budget that may not be able to pay their rent or electric bill coming forward, kind of more like the mortgage and rental assistance program and not fund their, their programs. Um, and, and then I think we need some type of additional documentation. As, as Jason brought up, there's probably hundreds of, you know, residential nonprofits for whatever reason they got a 501c3, but are they really doing anything to benefit the community um, like the ones we heard from today? So I do think, like Commissioner Adams said, there, there needs to be a more defining of who's going to be eligible. I know there's some nonprofits out there that, um, that have really deep, deep pockets right now. They have big, huge reserves. Um, we saw some of these through children's services where the decision was made to quit funding them just because they had such deep pockets and deep donor base. Um, I'd hate to have them just because they were early to apply and get five grand. You know, that's like the, the negative flack that came out when like a, an NBA basketball team worth a billion dollars got PPP money and things like that. So I think we need to really be very careful if we do decide to go this way, um, how, we, how we really further define who's, who's eligible. But I would uh, have to say that I would concur uh, with Commissioner Adams that now is not the time that we need to see, have staff come back with what CARES dollars we have left. And my understanding is that the, the new round of stimulus money that they're trying to get done before the end of March because a lot of the current uh, federal programs expire then. So it might behoove us to wait uh, until that p bill comes out and we see what that package looks like to go forward. But I think very similar to Commissioner Adams, I can't go forward on this right now until we see what dollars we have to work in the future. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I am like Commissioner Adams. I understand the value of 501c3s. I was instrumental in setting up a few in my previous career that, that, that we've done through the, through the Firefighters Association and, other word, and others, uh, even set up other five, 500 series uh, internal revenue code things, uh, manage the fare. You know, the fair was canceled last year. There's, a, there, there's a, an event last year that's totally dependent on fundraising. Um, so, so I understand. I understand. Uh, back when I was fair manager, we had the storm of the century. They even wrote a book about it and did a movie on it. So, uh, I, I relate to all these to, to all these adverse conditions that, that we work in. But you, as as, a, as the Marine Corps would say, you overcome and adapt. And I, I think that that that's that's part of what what we need to do here. There is there are so many great things out there to do. Another one that, that comes to mind is like Healthy Start Coalition. They're dancing with the stars that, that raised four hundred thousand dollars in two thousand and eighteen and another five hundred thousand I think roughly in two thousand nineteen have are basically shut out for two years on their on their program on that. And they and they do a lot of great things. And most most five oh one C threes that I'm familiar with it, I, I sincerely appreciate what they do, and they do, and, and again, they do great things. And like Commissioner O'Brien said, uh, any River County is is so philanthropic with their money, and and I, and I think that we see some light at the end of the tunnel with this, and that the good things are going to happen. Yeah, when you have a 1,500 501c3s that their that their you know revenues are almost at a billion dollars uh, overall, and their their values are that. 
and that their income is all, almost 900 and something million dollars. I think we're, I think they're in decent shape, but, but yet I understand what COVID has done to you. My priorities in COVID are, are businesses. Businesses are, are truly the backbone of our community with what they provide and what we need to, and we need to support. I am a little leery about uh, the uh, rental assistance program. I, I, I do see what our administrator says of the possibility of, of having a, a rush of it as soon as the, the moratorium is lifted on, on evictions. Um, it could, could be a reality. I, I'm a little leery on, on touching on that also. But what I, what I am for is, is, is trying to see what we can do. And I, I would like county staff to, to come back with maybe a, some more information, a plan of some sort, or uh, just to identify of what monies we have left. And, and maybe if the stimulus plan gets through the Senate, even though it has a lot of uh, uh, pork and, and things that on it, I, I think maybe you know, there could be some money there, but businesses are priority, making sure we get the vaccines, the expenses we have with uh, getting the vaccines and the shots in arms is, is, is the, those are the, those are the two priorities that I see, uh, not necessarily in order, shots in arms are the most important thing and businesses would be next, uh, is what we have to keep our focus on and not, not lose that. So, I don't know if I'm ready to, to, to make the decision at this time. There's a lot, of, a lot of questions that I have with regards to how and what we would do and how we would define and who would qualify and who wouldn't qualify, even though I appreciate Commissioner Moss spelling that out simply in, in her document here. I think there's some other unanswered questions, but I would support that uh, to see what staff can find out more information, what monies are available, and we may have to move this into the next round of, of, of COVID assistance. And I'm not, uh, so I'm not objecting to that. I, I want to help the 501c3s, but I, but I'm not so sure that today is the day to do that. I think there's that we're right at the cusp of coming into one year in this thing. That 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 the stimulus money is low. I mean, you said Jason, I'm correct. There's 300,000 out there. Uh, Three hundred thousand dollars out there for businesses that are waiting to find out whether they have money or not. Yes, yes, that we're short on the current. So, it, th those are those are the the most important things to me to me right now. And I just think maybe today is not the day. I, I have many unanswered questions of of, of who, uh, who 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 warrants uh, this and the fact that we are it's not maybe not county tax dollars, but it is federal tax dollars. And we have to be good stewards of the community and, and do our fiduciary duty on that. So, um, I would I would support turning this over to staff with a little more research on it to find out exactly what we what we can do, what we can do. Maybe by then we'll know what the what the Senate, the United States Senate's going to do, and if they're going to pass money down this way, and and maybe that maybe some funds could be eligible. But I just think today I'm not. Uh, I've got too many unanswered questions right now of how we're going to do this. So, Heather, I do have a question for you. Where's this, does, and or Jason also, does the city of Vero <laughs> Beach do any CARES funding uh, distribution or are we, so, are we totally responsible for that? So that came to counties. We did share our, we, we did offer funding to the cities. They all took us up to, to varying levels. So they have their, um, they have their own programs, but they, they don't have any additional money probably to, to, to bring forward some things. Some of the stuff they did was they, they provided 120,000 additional to the small business assistance program that we had. I um, think they did the same for maybe the SRA um, program. Uh, but yeah, they, they did receive some money, um, but uh, not, not a uh, Vero, yeah, ended up spending less than their, than their initial, um, about 267,000 plus the 120 for the small business plus maybe 80 or 100,000 for the, for the SRA money. Um, I think their initial allocation may have been 600,000, but we're um, with with everything included. To where I was going with that, Heather, was if the city of Vero Beach had any additional support for you through through a different to a different channel with their with any money that with any money that they might have had. Um. Not that they have made me aware of, and they returned 
um, some of their money. Like Jason just said, the city actually returned unused money at the end of the year because they thought they were required to spend it by the, 30, the 30th, I think it was, December 30th or December 31st. Unfortunately, that timeline changed, but I'm pretty sure, I, obviously, I cannot speak on behalf of the city. We're a private nonprofit. We're not the city. Um, but I think they gave, the city of Vero Beach gave returned money. Yes, uh, that's my recollection also. The city of Vero Beach returned uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to the county. That is, that, yes. Um, so the CARES Act dollars had to be expended by December 30th. Um, and what we ended up doing was, was we were able to extend that um, through the public safety salaries, uh, which the board approved in December. Following that, we reached out to the municipalities to ask if they had additional needs uh, into the new year. Um, the city of Vero told us no. I think I think maybe one or two of the cities had something, but the the rest of the cities basically just said continue doing what you're doing, you know, with 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 the county dollars, but didn't take us up on 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 additional dollars. And I'm pretty sure that the city of Vero didn't didn't indicate that they need any more money. Okay, so, so for me right now, that's getting shots in arms getting the making sure that the businesses in our community are getting what they deserve through through the cares act dollars that's what it was that's what is directly intended for and uh, making sure that we kind of wait on the rental assistance because I'm, I'm a little bit uh, again leery of that but again i would i would i wouldn't mind seeing staff come back with some sort of some sort of information or a plan a more definitive plan on this at this time and maybe in the next wave of funding there there might be some ways to creatively do this to 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 maybe support 501 c3s uh that are that are small and and need and and, and might need assistance with, with stuff so that's kind of that's kind of where i'm going to leave it right now mr chairman i thank you so thank you sir um for something was just uh, mentioned as far as in reflecting to the a municipality when a city has a charter and uh, i would not want to discuss their spending or allocation uh, that's why they're designed that's why they exist so i i don't want to get involved with what monies they did use or allocate uh, they answer to the people that they serve and uh, we're very glad that they are making uh, positive decisions for the community um, with that, uh, I share many of the same thoughts. I just wanted to clarify a couple of items. Uh, I, I love uh, 501c3s and what they do. Doc, you know what I feel about your organization. And if I was an affluent person, your group would be going to Carnegie Hall, okay? Uh, I, I, it, it, it is, uh, you just have to watch the lottery tickets because I'm like, this, it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get there this way, but uh, I, I just want you to know that, that uh, appreciation, uh, some of the speakers today, uh, th there's nothing more rewarding than to, to visit uh, and, and see our cultural past and having it marked and watching the excitement of uh, children, knowing that they're learning and uh, appreciating the experience. And uh, we need more of that. That's part of the recovery too. It hasn't been there. And you haven't seen a whole lot of people at the uh, museum. Uh, however, uh, Ted, you've seen a lot of people uh, out there uh, your truck doesn't stop, and and I, I'm I'm just overwhelmed by the amount of benevolence that has supported you all. I just also want to say that some of the organizations that were represented today, uh, Commissioner O'Brien uh, stated that uh, we we did make a decision. It was a few years back that uh, we would not be going forward with uh, funding for. 501c3s that we were paring down. The benevolence factor is so high in this community. Uh, but I just wanted to clarify uh, a few of the speakers today uh, do get funding through TDC. 
and uh, that TDC dollars is not customary tax dollars, those are the people who come and visit us and drop the dollars off because you all exist. So uh, it, it's a great mechanism. Uh, but uh, so there is a, a little caveat to that, that there is some taxpayer funding, even if they're, they're temporary taxpayers. Um, uh, with that said, looking at the larger picture, when this was first presented, I had heard rumors that the, uh, uh, that there was allocated uh, 1.5 or nearly $2 million to United Way and that only about fifty or sixty thousand dollars was uh, dispersed. This this list uh, reflects otherwise. It's over a million dollars, uh, one million and sixty-seven dollars, as of the time of this meeting, that has been distributed. And it's not about gloves. It's not about uh, a lot of the things that were purported. It's about needed materials and support to go forward at the time of recovery. And I, I think uh, this list clearly displays that those who applied did get funding. Some were denied because they did not fit the criteria. Well, if you don't fit the criteria, then, uh, I, you know, if you have, uh, I, I still don't understand the subcontracting application and I want to look at it too because uh, individuals who are doing good in the community and if they qualified as far as their effectiveness as far as what they were doing to go forward they were greatly impacted by COVID and their operations were curtailed if not ceased uh, well there's got to be a way to get through that uh, as far as any new found uh, operations, I, I don't necessarily know if this is the time. Earlier today when we had the presentation, I said we're putting this behind us. We are. We're gaining ground on the curve. Are we there? No. There could be a turn that we're unaware of because as you all have been aware of watching, when we first started the rollout, we had IT challenges, we had distribution challenges, we had a supply challenge. It's getting there just, and that's just with the vaccine, not, we're very grateful that uh, our, our governor has supported an open philosophy and many organizations are open. We're getting there, folks, and we're doing a lot better, and that's why so many people are wanting to move to our community, because we're doing it. And if that's the case, I'd like to continue on. Uh, I have the same reservations and concerns about taking any dollars uh, from rental and mortgage assistance. There are a lot of people that are hurting for survival, not for any other endeavor, for a roof over their heads. And I, I think that we have to uh, pause just a little bit to ensure that we're able to, through the COVID relief dollars, to be able to offer that sustenance, that level, because everybody deserves a roof over their head. And at this time, it's been very difficult. It's gotten a little better, but it could go the other direction. So I don't think I am ready to support uh, the endeavor as well. Okay. Commissioner Moss. Um, yes, and uh, and thank you. you know, I want to say I you know I appreciate the the thoughts and the insight of all of my colleagues, and a special thank you to uh, Commissioner Ehrman um, for your encouragement in this regard. And I hope that all of you feel that way. Um, remember, this is not the first time we're talking about this. The first time we talked about this was when I suggested it on January 5th. And at that time, the context was such that you may recall the small businesses were not coming forward. We didn't have a lot of small businesses coming forward to claim the $5,000 grant. At that time, it was 5000 And I suggested on January 5th that we open it up to uh, the small nonprofits, and um, 
Well, that didn't that didn't happen. I won't I, you know, I won't go into to the reasons why it didn't happen at that time, but the money was there. So I don't want to hang this all on money because when you really want to do something, you find the money. And and there's no disrespect intended to anyone. I did speak with the county administrator about this. I would not bring something before you based on my say so. I, I would never do that um, to you. I think that you know, that would be disrespectful to bring something before you that I had not discussed uh, with the county administrator with regard to finances. And it was beyond uh, mortgage assistance. I know that that's uh, a beloved program. Um, it appears there we may end up with a surplus in that. We can't say for sure right now. But January, January 5th, we did have the money, and we didn't do it. So let's let's not hang it on, on money alone. And just to, uh, you know, I appreciate that you're considering it today, and hopefully we're moving it forward. I think this is something that's it's, it's important. It should be moved forward, and we, if the staff can work on it now, what you saw today and what was uploaded, that's not a final product. Um, and I think several times today I asked for your help in defining what the criteria should be. That's not a final product, what was uploaded uh, with the agenda. Um, the intent is not to fill all the holes. That's not going to happen. We didn't do that with small business. We didn't, we didn't fill all the holes. 5,000, 10,000, that didn't, that, didn't, uh, that didn't fill all the holes for them. And nor would I expect it to fill all the holes for our nonprofits. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, you know the, we do have a wonderful philanthropic community. We all know that. We absolutely do. But a lot of that is, you know, big guys with big organizations, big or, the large organizations are very well healed, well endowed, well funded. They can carry on throughout uh, God knows what, and God bless them for it. This is more, you know, COVID hit the little guy. And by little guy, I mean the little guy in the community and the little guy who supports the little guys who are nonprofits. Okay, it's little guy to little guy. And thank you uh, to Ted for mentioning he got a $5 check the other night. I mean, you know, that's, that's what we're talking about here. You know, you're talking about the little guys. And I really think, you know, you need to help the little guys. I don't think we can just... Uh, say, well, we live in a philanthropic community, so everything is all going to just work out somehow. Uh, you know, I, I think that I would like to believe that, but I don't think you can count on that. Little guys to little guys, the little guys have been the hardest hit. And I mean that as individuals, and I mean that with regard to the, to the nonprofits. Um, they're, they're the hardest hit, and I, do, I don't think we can count on... Uh, on you know philanthropy to make up for all of that to compensate for all of that. Um, so I would hope that uh, you know the majority of us could agree. We don't all have to agree that you know let staff work on this now because it looks like there there will be funding of some kind and I I don't know what kind. I did speak with the county administrator. He did indicate there might be other funding available. Um, but why don't we start working on it now? Because we've been, we've, I mentioned it January 5th. Now we're at March 2nd. If money becomes available, I think we want to be in the position to just move on it right, right then and there. Because we've, we've addressed the needs, and thank you to all of you. I think we've done, I think we've completed a really important mission, not only getting shots in arms, and you're right, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for mentioning that. That was our primary mission, to get shots in arms. And I think we uh, we were very support. None of us planned to be in the healthcare business, and then we all and then we all were. <laughs> but everybody did a great job, and thank you to the vice chair for actually asking the governor when he was here for a greater supply. I mean, you know, God bless you. You were right out there on the field, you know, asking for it. So, uh, you know, I want to and, and our county administrator. I mean, we've all worked very hard, so we got the shots in arms, and we. Like I said, it was like a reverse bank robbery. We were standing there with bags of money and nobody was showing up. I've never been in a situation like that before. But it did, it did become a, a, a successful program. We see now we have to, uh, you know, to, to see what's left on the, on the back end of it. But I, th I think, you know, I want to commend all of you. 
you know, I think we, we've done a yeoman's job. What I'm asking simply is let staff look at this now. I think it's, you know, it's an important thing to do and I understand. It's a one-time event. I, I, I'm in agreement with you that you don't fund nonprofits. I wasn't here when, when you decided that, but I, you know, I, I, I can see, you know, what you're, what you're thinking with that. And um, I, I, would, I would say that I probably would, be in, in, would have been in agreement that day that you made that decision. So this is a, this is a one-time event. Um, you know, it, it's a pandemic. I mean, you know, we haven't had one in 100 years. So I think you can, you can do something different uh, during a pandemic that wouldn't necessarily be done, you know, on, on, on any other occasion. So I, you know, I appreciate that, you know, everything that, you know, that, that you've had to say, and um, I hope that there's enough, you know, a consensus or a majority that we can at least have staff, you know, review the criteria. Uh, as I said, this was just a starting point. I, I never looked at this as final. I mean, this is not something that I'm prepared to do. Um, you know, small profits contributed to their thoughts on it. Uh, staff is, uh, thought on it is certainly needed. Uh, we need to flesh it out, but I think we, I would say, spend some time on it now so that we are prepared. I think there'll be funding of some kind. Maybe, maybe it won't be as large an amount of funding as we had for the small business program, but I, I think this is important. Um, you know, it's a commitment to make to do the best we can for them, whatever that turns out to be. I, I don't know yet what the best will be, but let's, let's try to do it. That's, that's all I would ask today. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to kind of add, um, as Commissioner Moss said, she brought this up on January 5th, but it didn't go anywhere. And so basically, Commissioner Moss, you kind of ran it up the flagpole and it, and it didn't fly. And so I'm a little surprised that you're acting or, or kind of chastising us for moving so slow. Um, there wasn't any initial support for this back on January 5th. Um, from what I've heard, I, I don't see a whole lot of support for it right now. Um, so, you know, sometimes you got to read the tea leaves and, you know, you've decided to make this your, your project, but there wasn't any support for it from the get-go back on January 5th. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if I want to have staff spend a whole lot of time doing this because I'm not hearing broad support from the board for this. And I know Jason is up to his eyebrows just trying to get these vaccines out and, you know, kind of give him a whole new big project. I, I don't know if that's the best use of his time. So, you know, just and this maybe just my personal thought, but I, I didn't hear any real support here. I didn't hear any gung-ho yeah, let's charge into this. So I'd, I'd just kind of advise you to kind of keep that in mind. And um, I, I, I really don't think I want to burden Jason with anything more right now than what he's got on his plate is, is where I'm sitting. Maybe a month or so from now or a couple months, um, if we see more vaccines coming in and things calm down, um, then we can maybe have staff start thinking about this. But right now, you know, I, I, I think we're up to our eyeballs and just trying to get these vaccines out. And I don't see any broad support for this. So I'm not in favor of going anywhere with it right now, just to be honest with you. Well, I, that's the point. I think it's right now that is the issue. And we did in January, as I said earlier, um, you know, the focus was on just getting shots in arms, as it, you know, as it should have been. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm assuming that that was the reason why we didn't go into a detailed discussion of it at that time, uh, not to my recollection. But the focus then was shots in arms, and as I said earlier, I think that's, and as uh, the county administrator reported, we've made great strides in that. And again, you know, thanks to you, thank you for being out on the field and talking to the governor in that regard, asking him for a greater supply. So. Um, you know we've you know we've we've done that. We'll continue to do that. Um, we, we, we're getting very few takers now, but it, it still will take you know weeks or, or, or months to to hit everyone. But what I, what what I was hearing was that people um, are are in 
in favor, not at this time, is, 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 was the main thing that was said, that was repeated. It wasn't, you know, um, I will never do this. It was not at this time. That was, that was what I heard. And that was, that was what I was, I was responding to. And not to, that's not to disparage anybody. I, th I think everyone sitting here has done a great job. Every, every single one of my colleagues. I mean, I know for so with Sunshine, we, you know, we can't speak to each other other than publicly. But um, I, I think different, uh, different uh, ones of us have reported at uh, other meetings where, you know, we did, we got a lot of emails and a lot of telephone calls. There was a huge amount of concern uh, these last several months uh, all about vaccinations. And that took, that took a lot of our time um, and effort, as, as it should. I mean, that was, that was everyone's highest priority. Uh, was to to handle the the vaccination program in the best possible manner, and I I give all of my colleagues credit as I, I think we all uh, did, absolutely did the, the the best we could, and thanks again for being out in the field with the governor. But that, you know, what I was hearing today was just now is not the time, and that's fine. If now now is not the time, I'm not I'm not um, you know I'm not disagreeing with that. But what I'm saying or requesting respectfully is just to, you know, start, I, I just, I'm concerned that uh, all of a sudden we'll definitely have money and then it'll be like, well, yeah, but we don't have anything in place and we haven't really looked at this. And so it's, oh, it's, let, hard, let me, to, it, you know, it's hard to know, you know, what the proper timing is. It's a pandemic. I agree. It's hard to have exact timing during a pandemic. You would like to have you 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 would like to have a plan intact in in the the event that funding becomes available that we'll have the discretion and the avenue to deliver just, I, just, I understand just that to start but at it that's all. that's not the only concern mm -hmm. in addition i want you to know that i have uh, far more faith in staff uh, and they have adapted to overcome very swiftly, um, as I was talking with the uh, fire chief uh, this week, I said, you probably have worked the longest hurricane in the history of Indian River County. And uh, the chief is 24 seven on this. But I wanna identify even more day-to-day -day operations uh, for Jason has been a little burden too. Different members of staff were moved swiftly to the EOC and then gradually there was assistance from other entities uh, and we, we thank the city of Sebastian uh, and the sheriff's office uh, for supplying uh, aside from the volunteers uh, to make the communication process far better just by the abundance of call takers and information specialists in the process. But doing so, we've had to adapt. A lot of that work had to be pushed off to the side to the day-to-day -day operations so that our citizens could be taken care of that the information got out. There were many complications with the process and th there was some failures uh, that were overcome. These were done within a few days. So I don't believe that we need to set something forward for a month from now, or two months from now, or whenever that day comes when there is a different environment to work with. And I think that setting forward a stage for the future, um, well, planning is always a, a, a very good idea. We do that uh, consistently. I don't believe that we need to plan for this event. And I, again, have a lot more faith in our staff that within days we can have this all wrapped up very tight. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so I'll ask our county administrator, would you be <laughs> able to have this all wrapped up within days? 
I I would would need direction from the board on. No, no, I'm not 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 today. I mean, when 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 if if we get a second wave of funding or actually, um, when were you planning to come back with the revised uh, cares? Because I, I know you've mentioned this at other meetings, and you mentioned it to me that you're planning to come back to let us know exactly what was spent anyway. And I think that that will be sometime soon, but I don't know exactly when. Would you care to comment on that? We're planning on doing that later this month. Could be on the 9th or could be on the 16th. Okay, so it'll be in the next week or two. So in, in the next week or two, we'll know um, what, you know, what was spent. At, or, I mean, for the community, we started with $28 million. $28 million of uh, approximately, you'd say if you round it off, it was, I think it was like 27, eight or nine. So that, that's what we started with. So we'll see what we'll see what we have left. Uh, we'll know that at the next meeting or the following meeting within a week or two, and I guess yeah we can discuss it at that time when we have those numbers Not in front of us. Not about what's left in the bank. It's about what we are confronted with, what we are doing to ensure the greater good of the community. Right. It, it, it really no. I don't want to take part one of part of it and say oh look at this we found some funding. It's not about finding funding. It's about what we may have to do in unknown, uncertain times. We're getting a, a, a very good grasp of it now. The numbers reflect that. And the people in the community are feeling, feeling freer to walk about and navigate into their customary lifestyle. Uh, some are very reserved yet. And I believe that if we continue on with the vaccines and the, the, all of the, the planned events I, uh, of, of address, I believe we will be there. But it's not just about a pot of money. Again, Wednesday, we're, we're, we're looking at the sheriff's barbecue. It's going to be adjusted, but it's going to happen. The firefighters' fair is coming about. These events would not be opening up if there was not uh, a viability of an, 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 abil an ability for people to come out and exchange, yes, proper we wearing a, a, a mask or social distancing. It's still not the same. So with that in mind, we don't know what we will have to do. It would just go back just three weeks ago. Plans were changing by the minute. A new vaccine came out yesterday. J and J came out. We had limit limitations. We were getting a hundred vaccines a, a, a day. A week ago from Friday, 850 shots were delivered into arms. 850 in one day. That's not including what happened at the other outlets, all of the community partners, the supermarkets the pharmacies that are now addressing it. It has opened up again. But things are changing. The, the, this has been a, a fast-moving target. So I wouldn't rely upon, well, if we find out the Senate passes it and we're going to get this stream of money, let's have the plan. I, I don't I don't think this is uh, a gridiron. I don't no, I think, think it, it's for it's for the it, county administrator to say when to. he when he reports back on the Wait for the pump. Punt. Here's funding, but and he'll, I'm, sh I'm assuming no, we'll have the COVID report it's also. It's not no. for the county administrator to decide. No, not it's to decide, but to say what the... I finish talking, you've had a lot of time to speak. It's for us to decide, and it's for us to determine how we move forward. And then we, as commissioners, do the work to get our items in order, present to each other so we can all buy into it, then we work with staff to implement. You're trying to get staff to do the work that you should be doing. This is your item. We've all given a lot of feedback onto it, into it. I would suggest that you listen to the feedback, you tweak your item, and then do with that as you want, but it's not to direct staff to fix it, and it's not to direct staff to find the funding. That's our job as commissioners. So that's your job in this item if you want to pursue it. We have given input. Take that input, tweak your item, and we'll go from there. But at this point, there's not the support to move forward based on the concerns that the commissioners 
have brought up. So I, I think at this point, we're beating a dead horse and we're just arguing amongst ourselves to argue amongst ourselves and it's not productive. I think the productive part of this discussion has already happened and we just need to move forward. You have your feedback. I would suggest you make the changes. We'll hear from staff either at the next meeting or the meeting after that, how we're gonna plug the holes that the rest of us have concerns information on how to move forward with something like this. But again, I would just suggest you take the feedback, tweak it and go from there. Okay. Well, thank, well thank, thank you all for your feedback. And uh, as I said, I did ask for your help several times today and I appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Airman. Uh, Commissioner Moss, I would, I would uh, also maybe tend to agree with, uh, a, a little more with Commissioner Adams on that, that I think you can use staff and, and I wouldn't mind, you know, coming back with something in 30, 45 days or something, because I, I, I am like Commissioner O'Brien. I don't want to I don't want to tax Jason with anything else to do, but I know Jason's the kind of guy and his staff and Kristen and others would be more than willing to, to, to help you uh, with this. We don't know, uh, like, I said, like I said earlier, today to me is, is not the day. I think there's too many unanswered questions with our funding, where it's gonna go and, and what direction it's gonna go. But I, I am not against entertaining this. I, would, I, would, I personally would have some rules that I would put on maybe uh, you know, a staff of a, 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 a nonprofit that, that uh, doesn't get any direct county funding uh, through any other sources, maybe a staff that's got no paid staff or maybe one paid staff member or two paid staff members. So they are the really small ones that I think that are suffering out there, as, as, you, as you said. I, I, I don't really have any objection, but we also have to make sure, and Jason, am I right to say this, that we that the CARES Act money, we don't know what the Biden administration, what stipulations are gonna be put on it, where we had a little more freedom through the Trump and, and, the, uh, and the state, it gave us a little more leeway to, to do some things with that. Am I, would I be a correct statement? Yeah, and we don't know what that's going to look like yet. It hasn't passed. It could change, and sometimes the, the final rulemaking's not done even when it's passed, and so there's a waiting time to, to figure all that they, stuff They out. may put strict stipulations on it to say this is the only thing you can use it for. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so, so those, are, those are things that may happen. We won't know that until it gets out of the Senate and, and gets out of Washington, D.C., and God knows who knows what, when that'll happen. But... Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to, to, to listening to this again with, like Commissioner Adams said, with maybe some more specific, more specific information of how we want to do this. But in some of my recommendations, again, would be make sure they are. They're very small, 501c3s, if, if, if and when we can do that. And then, then I think we'll decide whether we can do that because I am, a, you know, even though it's not our tax dollars, it, it is our tax dollars from a federal level, and I'm a little bit leery on how we would spend that. And if I would have been on the commission, as you said, when, when these two old timers here were on it, that I probably wouldn't have voted either to, uh, to give it, to give tax dollars. I wouldn't have voted either to give tax dollars to, 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 to nonprofits at the time. But again, those, those, again, I go, those are time, times are different right now. And hopefully we can get back to those times. So I, I'm not opposed to, to, to coming back in 30 to 45 days with something. I think we'll know more back then. We'll, we'll know where we're at with CARES money. We'll know what the stipulations are. But again, my priority is set on getting shots in arms and making sure that we fund what we have available now and make sure that those, that those things happen. I, I don't want to try to speculate or, or tell the future. And I, again, am like Commissioner Fleischer, if I win the, 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 the billion dollar uh, you know, uh, jackpot, some of these 501 C3s won't have an issue. But that's, you know, that's, that's here nor there. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. And uh, so, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to, to listening to something, you know, in say 30 to 45 days from now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the benefit of your, of your insight, Commissioner Irwin. Anything further? No, not for me. Okay. Seeing anything else? Does anybody else have anything for the greater good? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>